know that's like a percent increase. Hey, Mayor, Mayor, I think we've got this room to be clean on Saturday. Yeah. And we did. Bill Jeff Salado, regular board of aldermen meeting, Salado Municipal Building, 301 North Stagecoach, Salado, Texas. Today is September the 5th, 2019. It's 6.30 p.m. Call to order. Call of roll. Here. 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 Joe, where are you? You're going to do our prayer tonight, huh? Yes, sir. Okay, Joe Keys, you can just come up and do it. Yes, sir. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful uh, as we come here this evening for the opportunity to gather and those that are gathered here today. Father, we are thankful for being in uh, the village of Salado the opportunity that you've afforded us to live in this uh, wonderful place uh, with wonderful people, Father, with a wonderful spirit. And we pray, uh, Father, for the proceedings this evening. We're thankful that we can have these opportunities for uh, exchanges of ideas um, and discussions. And Father, uh, that we have, that we live in a land where we can openly do these kinds of things. We're thankful and we pray that we would not take these opportunities, these blessings that you grant us for, for granted, uh, but that we would uh, make the most of these times that we have. And Father, we pray that these proceedings uh, tonight will be conducted in a, in a spirit of uh, peacefulness, open-mindedness, conciliation. Uh, Father, that things will be done in ways that are uh, pleasing to you and things said uh, that are beneficial and um, Father, that they'll be done and conducted in ways that will be constructive. And we just pray for that kind of spirit and, and those kinds of hearts and minds as part of this group this evening. Father, we are, are thankful for the ways that you have blessed this community and in ways that uh, we begin to see people uh, moving uh, in, into this area, many people nowadays moving into this area. We pray, Father, for uh, measured growth and the ability to handle the, the growth that will inevitably come uh, and to do that in, in constructive ways. And we pray, uh, Father, that you bless the leaders of this community, that you bless them with wisdom uh, as they make uh, decisions. May they lead in a way that's best for uh, the opportunities that come uh, more and more toward this community. Father, we just pray that uh, your spirit uh, be over this place and over this time and, and over this meeting tonight. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Joe. May we stand, please, for the Pledge of Your Allegiance. Honor. Your Honor. Your Honor, we have two guests that have volunteered to come lead us today in the uh, Pledge of Allegiance uh, legislatures. I'm blessed to uh, have great neighbors. You're right next to us. We have uh, Jackson Delio and Mia Delio. They're both uh, going to the Acton School, and uh, they have volunteered to come up here. And, and I appreciate Josh uh, getting the press to come up here and do this. So thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Come on up. Come on up around here. He's the mayor. You have to do what he says. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't sit in his seat. <laughs> <laughs> 
to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to Texas, one state under God, one in the invisible. Thank you. You may be seated. And with the exception of Frank and Amber, I don't get to sit up here, please. <laughs> Where'd you go? Oh, I want you to sit up. Sit up here. Have a seat. You gotta talk into this microphone, okay? That's good. Well, now tell me, how old are you? I am 13. 13. You, what grade are you in? Eighth grade. Eighth grade? Yes, sir. Are you passing yet? Yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> I am nine. I am fourth grade, and I do pass my school grades. You do? <laughs> well, both of y'all are. You're very pretty. Thank you. You're dressed nice. <laughs> you're very handsome. Well, I'm glad that you're up here. Um, have you ever been to one of these before? No, sir. Good. No. Can you hold your right hand up? No. Can you hold your right hand? Good. Okay. Uh, now, put it down. Um, I move. To adjourn? Yeah. Okay. So I move to adjourn. Good. All in favor, raise your hand, please. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for coming, folks. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, I really appreciate you doing that. Thank you very much. Mike has taken it upon himself to uh, get people to pray or ministers to pray and to have uh, the, our younger crowd, the ones who are citizens now, to uh, say the uh, Pledge of Allegiance and the Pledge to the Texas flag. Thanks a lot. Well, we have two of these, and this is Citizens Communications. And I'm sure that you know how to do this, but may I remind you, please, you come up to the lectern, you give your name and your address, and you talk to us and not to the committee or the people that are sitting out there. You have three minutes, and Mike has a little ringer over there that goes off in three minutes, and that is our polite way of saying, You've said enough, it's time now to sit down. But that's all we're going to do. Now I want you to understand that we will not and cannot ask any questions or make any comments during this part of the board meeting. Um, I think with that, we are ready for Paul Cox to come. Mr. Cox. <clears throat> Hi, I'm, I'm Paul Cox, uh, 2716 Winners Circle Drive in Salado. And I want to talk about the golf carts. Um, obviously, uh, the the, our current ordinance is kind of vague and open for interpretation in many, many ways. And uh, I've, I've done a lot of research. I've looked at golf carts, golf cart ordinances in Lakeway. I've talked to the city manager about it. I used to live there, actually. Uh, I've talked to a friend of mine that's on the the uh, 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 homeowners association at uh, Berry Creek, and I've I've looked at at uh, ordinances of Rockport, 
the village, the city of Rockport, uh, and their golf court ordinances. All of them have several things in common. All of them require driver's licenses. All of them require go to the golf course only. And all of them require no driving at night, anywhere. And no more than two miles from home base for any of this. You know, I, I don't think we all, I, I think golf carts are a part of our society here, which is great. However, I, I stopped a, a lady with her two children the other day. I waved her down and she stopped. A young lady with, with, there was one, looked like four, maybe five that was driving. She was sitting in the passenger side with a younger child between her legs standing up, maybe three years old. I said, ma'am, you should be driving this. Those kids don't need to be behind this wheel. She said, oh, it's perfectly legal. If, as long as I'm in the car, they can drive. That's what these people believe out there. And why? Because we don't have specific ordinances and, and, and about the rules of the road and who can drive and who can't. And I know it's a hassle to have to enforce that, but we're going to have a major problem if somebody has a wreck and somebody sues the village because their ordinance is so weak. It's, it's, it's not clear on who can drive, and we let it happen. We can't do that. We need it fixed. And that's up to you all. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Miss Judy Fields. I'm coming back six foot nine, my enough life. Uh, Judy Fields, 818 Blaylock Circle. I'm here as the president of the Salado Historical Society. And it's almost Christmas. Surprise. The Society is excited to present the Tour of Homes again this year, and Shirley Lett is our chairman, and she has six beautiful homes already lined up. We've made changes to the uh, tour event and to bring it into the 21st century. Saturday, December the 7th is the only day the tour will be presented from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Tickets available online for purchase at the Tourism Center only one day, December the 7th. Cash or check from 8.45 until 3.45, and they will be $25 each. No tickets are gonna be sold at the homes on the tours. We are making appointments for television, newspaper, radio interviews, and we're working through the Village Voice and Robbie Pettit, who they both entities have been tremendous help so far too. We've ordered three four by eight foot banners to be placed on I-35 north and southbound visibility. Currently, we're negotiating with the digital sign in a very prominent place. There's promising really good uh, fees for that, so we're excited about it. We're having rack cards and posters made up for all this information. They will include Salado Chamber of Commerce Christmas stroll dates and to support the Chamber of Commerce, and we're not charging them to do that, even though they did charge us whenever they did it in the past, have their rack cards. That's okay. We wanna bring a lot of people into Salado, spend the money. In the past, the rack cards were mailed from the tourism office at no charge to the organization holding the event. The monies for such mailings came from the hotel occupancy tax which was a legal use of these monies to promote tourism. Salado Tourism no longer offers any organization in Salado this benefit. So we will be handle, handling, handing out the posters and rack cards throughout various cities, village, and locations of Central Texas ourselves. We've never had to do that before. Please support us and help us bring a lot of people into Salado to spend their money in our shops and have a fantastic Christmas tour stroll and a home tour like we've never seen before. We need to blow this little village up and tell people how unique we are and how proud we are of this village. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Those are the only two that I have, so we will continue on. 
with our business for tonight. And as you have seen, there's a lot of business. Consent agenda. A, approval of minutes of the regular board of Alderman meeting of August 15th, 2019. B, approval of the FY 2019 quarterly investment reports for the village of Salado. I'll entertain a motion, please. Move that we approve the consent agenda. Second. Motion has been made and second. Discussion? Question. Question has been called. All in favor, please. Likewise, against passage. <laughs> Judy, I couldn't speak while you were talking or even afterwards, but you could have seven houses. You could. Uh, I don't think it's allowed to address the comments at this point. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Okay. But. Uh, <laughs> I just gave you an entrance there. Okay. Status reports. Village administrator. Yes, sir, Mary. Let me run through uh, several items uh, for you and members of the public. Uh, first of all, status report on the wastewater project. Uh, property owners are continuing the, the slow process of connecting to the wastewater system. Approximately 42% have connected or are in the process of connecting to the wastewater system at this time. Uh, others are starting to line up cards that will be mailed to property owners within the initial service area to remind the owners of the October 1st connection deadline. I want to have some discussion before we jump off of wastewater on this particular topic with you all a little bit about this issue. Before we send out the cards, uh, if there's interest in, in talking about extending the deadline or some other idea that you'd like to put on the next agenda to talk about that particular topic. Uh, but we'll, we'll revisit that in just a moment. The Slato ISD schools on Thomas Arnold Road are connected. Uh, the process is underway to connect the high school. Uh, no issues are reported right now with the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, all of the tests on the, uh, the discharge, what limited it is, uh, are coming out uh, very well. In fact. Uh, we're awaiting the arrival of a coal tank system to address the periodic odor issues that we're all aware of at the uh, Royal Street lift station. We've also uh, basically ordered an additional tank system for the Church Street lift station as a precautionary step. And that should go a long way for solving uh, the issues that exist over there at this point. I wanted to run through some cost estimates for you at this stage of the game because we've gathered the numbers <clears throat> based on the possible extension of the system, uh, both on the east side and the west side of the interstate. There are several options we're looking at right now as far as, uh, as, far as extending the system based on customer interest. Uh, the folks at Sonic have notified us that they're interested in coming online and getting to the system. Uh, and so we've developed a cost estimate for them uh, for a low pressure extension if this is just them we're extending to. Uh, it would be coming off of Williams Road, going to Sonic. There would be a, a grinder pump system, a duplex system that would be involved in that. And the price tag, the estimate is at this stage of the game for that is about $57,000 if we go that route. Uh, if we were to try to serve Sonic, Country Boys, Fairway, Cowboys, and Robertsons, uh, it sounds like the title of a country music song, doesn't it? Uh, if we were to try to uh, serve that particular area, we'd use a low-pressure line, just that limited area. We'd extend with the low-pressure line with, uh, again, duplex systems for those locations uh, to the tune of about $282,000. Uh, significant chunk of that cost, keep in mind, is the, the duplex systems that we're providing. Uh, since these are additional areas, as you know, in the initial service area, we're providing the grinder pumps. These would not be part of the initial service area. So it may be a decision you'd make if we went this route to have them acquire their own grinder pumps and we simply uh, you know, deal with the cost of the, of the line from that standpoint. Uh, but again, keep in mind, the policy we have in place right now says if you request the service, you're responsible for the costs involved for design and installation uh, if you're outside the initial service area. Uh, so the cost of that would be about $282,000 for a low-pressure line extension. Then we've had interest, as you know, expressed to, to go up to 2484 uh, from Williams Road. Uh, we gave, as you know, an original estimate to, to do basically a low-pressure line extension uh, that would have a pump system attached to that. Not a, not a lift station, but a, a smaller system, a quad. Uh, and, and that estimate for the low pressure was about $465,000. That estimate would have served basically uh, the convenience store piece that, that was proposed up at the intersection of 2484. At the time we gave that estimate to them, we didn't have full detail on what it is they actually were proposing at that location. Subsequent discussions with those individuals have indicated the development will be far greater than that. Uh, to include a hotel, some retail, uh, to include maybe an assisted living facility, uh, to include uh, maybe some restaurants, and again, the convenience store. Uh, that clearly is not going to get served with a low-pressure system. Uh, that, that's going to require basically a force main 
uh, which means that it's, it's going to end up being a much more expensive system. It's also going to be a system that would be limited, uh, as far as this construction piece, limited to serving that developer because you can't go putting uh, lifts there, or you can't go putting the grinder pumps into a, into a force main. It doesn't work that way. So the cost to run, a, basically the cost to run a force main uh, and a lift station that would be required with this, uh, with engineering and design costs included, is somewhere in the neighborhood of about $1.4 million, $1.250 to be exact. So the question is this, if you run that line all the way to 2484 from Williams, what happens to the guys in between if they can't tap that force main? Well, you'd still do the you do the, the low pressure extension in that situation, and that again would be a, another two hundred eighty-two thousand uh, dollars to pull that one off. So basically, to serve the entire uh, the entire frontage area uh, on the west side of the interstate is going to cost you somewhere in the neighborhood of about uh, one point seven one point eight million uh, along those lines to, to do it all. Turnkey part of it's low pressure, part of it's of course main. The Salado Library has expressed interest in connecting to the system. Uh, if we were to do that with a low pressure line, basically running from the, the Compass Bank area all the way across, the, the cost of that would be somewhere in the neighborhood of about $71,000. Again, there's a, a lift set or a, a grinder pump cost involved in that uh, you know, to serve that particular building, which is probably ten dollars $20,000. Uh, to do gravity to that location, if you chose to go gravity, uh, would be about $135,000. So then the question comes down to what do you do about the folks out at the Holiday Inn and, and the Days Inn site? Uh, they've been talking about it. They've been wanting wastewater up there in that particular area. Uh, we've, we've looked at that closer. The initial cost estimates we provided in the beginning were below pressure line because the only requesting party at that time was the Holiday Inn. And we felt like we could possibly tie a couple of smaller customers on. As you know, they're planning development over there at that particular intersection on that side of the highway to include potentially maybe another hotel also to include uh, some convenience stores uh, that would include fast food restaurants. So you're not gonna serve that particular area uh, with, with a low pressure line with that much development. So then we looked at the idea of building a gravity line at that location. And uh, the costs you see at this stage of the game are, are the updated costs we have for basically running a gravity line uh, from Salado Plaza up to FM24, such that all those properties in between would have the ability to tap it. The cost for that extension, again, is $1.358 million. Uh, which is a significant chunk. Would it run along the frontage road? With this type of system, we think that probably from a gravity standpoint, we're going to have to find an alternative route uh, to get to them. Uh, and that more than likely would involve some easement acquisition and things along those lines. We've included some limited money in this cost estimate, but again, until we start having discussions with property owners about access, uh, that cost is really totally unknown at this point. The Royal Street extension, which basically takes it from the manhole uh, at the corner of the church property, uh, all the way down to Smith Bluff. Uh, we talked about this in previous meetings. We have gravity line, but the cost of that extension would be $190,362. Uh, so the question is, what about Berkshire Brothers? What about Salado Plaza? Uh, that would be a low pressure line, and that would run basically down uh, Salado Plaza Drive, uh, somewhere to the tune of about $75,000. And then we've had uh, interest expressed by some folks on Rock Creek. Right now, the the two properties uh, on Main Street in the area of Rock Creek that are to be served in the initial service area are Barton House and the Solace Gallery. Uh, but we've had some interest from some of the folks further down. The Reed's property had, had interest in connecting. I believe uh, the Art Gallery uh, next door to the Reed's property has expressed interest in connecting. Uh, we've looked at alternatives to get to that location because there's some tricky grade to deal with down there, but you've also got some significant use, in particular down at the Barton House. And the estimated cost of running the full extension line down there to that to serve those properties, uh, and it would be an LP line again, would be $129,230. And you've got lift station costs, not lift station costs, but you've got a uh, grinder pump costs included in that. Uh, that would be a combined cost that would incorporate all of those properties, including the two that are part of the original service area. Um, so those are the costs that, that we're looking at. We're, we're pretty comfortable with the numbers as far as the, the estimates. Um, as you know, the Royal Street is already designed. We've talked about that in the past, and that cost will be recovered from the developer uh, you know, when, when we get to that annexation point and do the, uh, do the reimbursement agreement for construction of that line. Uh, the others at this stage of the game, uh, unless this board decides differently, uh, the others fall into any further extensions fall into our policy, and that is you're responsible for paying for the cost of the extension, uh, that, that the village is not going to pay for that. Obviously, that impacts what we can collect in the way of impact fees from them. Only a percentage of the impact fee can be collected. 
uh, but that's the policy we have in place. Uh, so I just wanted to kind of let you guys see those numbers and we'll circulate those, let you chew on more. We may want to talk about it more and maybe a workshop session to talk about how we want to proceed with, with dealing with some of these issues. Some of these, some of these extensions could potentially be negotiated as part of development agreements uh, in which there's reimbursement that comes through either uh, some type of increment financing or, or some other type of, uh, you know, refunding mechanism, be it the property tax, be it sales tax from that development. But at this stage of the game, the policy says the person requesting the service pays for the extension. Uh, in the case of Rock Creek, for example, if those property owners don't want to get together and pay for that extension, then right now it's part of the house and solid scouter to get served. Uh, it, it doesn't make sense to, to, you know, to, to do anything different that so uh, those are the numbers and like i said we'll circulate those and, and, and probably at some point we'll try to visit with some of the property owners now now that we're up we've got a system running and, and they have a better idea of what all is involved as far as wastewater goes let's go back to the the, the concept of connection uh you know it's, no one said it was going to be a fast connection process you've obviously extended the deadline once uh we're prepared to send out cards to remind people uh, about the october 1 deadline that's looming uh, as far as connections with the remaining parties in that. Uh, we don't want to send that out and then have you turn around on the, on, on the next meeting, the 19th meeting, and say, well, we're going to extend that deadline again uh, because we don't want to create you know, any confusion in communication with these. People are moving in the direction. Uh, we have some that are opposed, obviously, uh, to paying the connection fees and have issues with it, with the impact fees. But uh, my point is this, and that is, I guess I'm interested in hearing your thoughts uh, about the idea of putting an item on the agenda for the 19th meeting, our next regular meeting, uh, to, to talk about that deadline and how we want to deal with it. I know the question came up uh, a couple of meetings ago about whether the council had made a commitment not to revisit any adjustments to the impact fees uh, until a year from now. And that commitment in our research is not there. I think the, the reference and the understanding about that was the fact that we talked about having the impact advisory committee uh, do an annual review of those impact fees as part of their responsibility to see if they need to be adjusted in any form or fashion. But we also stressed in those discussions that that did not preclude this board from at any time going in and making a modification to the impact fee. So the question was this, and that is, uh, as an incentive uh, to get people to move people forward, the, the remaining who have not connected, uh, do you want to look at maybe a longer deadline and look at maybe an adjustment in the impact fee for those who don't meet that deadline? Uh, do you want to leave it as is, simply give them more time? Uh, it, it really is up to you all. I just kind of want to get your feeling on that before I go sending out a postcard as a reminder notice to folks. You're asking for a feeling now. Yes, sir. Uh, floor is open to address Don's concern. Uh, I have a question, Don. Yeah. <laughs> so the criteria, do we have a criteria, criteria for extension or did you say we're not ready to connect? Do we have like certain things that have to be met before we can grant an extension? No, it's, it's, it'd be, it would be an agreement that they would execute with the village for reimbursement of the costs or a situation where they would agree to do the costs on their own with our approval. That's typically the way you do that. Now, the, the criteria would be if you did a development agreement. And in, in the course of a development agreement, for example, one of these particular extensions we've talked about, there's been some discussion at the table about the idea of maybe entering into some type of development agreement that would potentially reimburse some of those costs. But typically, that's what's done. Though. Other questions or discussion, please, to Don. Well, Don, I want to understand that after one October, if uh, if the uh, prospective tappy has not shown up into your office and paid uh, or made arrangements to pay uh, the uh, impact fees, then their option of paying out at no interest rate for 48 months it evaporates is that correct yes they lose that they lose that opportunity and they also face the possibility for your ordinance of the village potentially if need be or desires to do so going over their property and making the connection and leaning the property to the costs involved and i think we're trying to avoid that Other discussion, please. The other issue you run into is this, you know, and that is you've got some developments tapping on your door right now, we're in sewer capacity. 
you know, and, and if, if, if they're not connected on the, by that particular date and there's another developer that wants that capacity, you know, do you allocate that capacity to that development mm -hmm. and then leave the person in the initial service area out, out, out of the car? I don't think you do that. But I guess my point is this, that's out there. Other questions to Don? Don, do you really think we can accomplish something by putting it on a workshop? Oh, I don't think it's a workshop. I think we're at a point where we need to, you're going to need to take action on how you want to handle this next round as far as the deadline goes. So, so what, you're, what you're asking for is to be put on the... Well, no, I guess what I'm asking for is this. Is there a willingness to the board to talk about an alternative to the October 1st deadline and if there is, we can put that on the September 19th agenda. If there's not, we'll send the postcards out to folks as a reminder. I just don't want to send a postcard out one week and then turn around the next week and have to send a letter out saying King's X. You know, this is this is the deal. I, I, th I think it's prudent if, if we've drawn a line in the sand, October 1, then we need to stick with that plan. Because I think if you kick this down the road farther and farther and farther, you're never going to get to the end. Okay. That's just my, my personal point. That's why you set a short deadline in the beginning, because the concern was if you gave them nine months or six months in the beginning, they wait until day 10 before it's over and then they're faced with another extension. I, I vote we, we stick with the deadline. That's, that's my view. Do any of you we can't put this to a vote because it's not a board. No, this is just to get consensus whether we want to put it out on the agenda. Do, do, you, do any of you want to voice your opinion about this? Yes or no, maybe? I'm against the fate of the endless, so I'm not. I'll, I'll the deadline's there. If we decide to extend it, I'm fine with that too. I just I don't, I don't like the feet of the endless so, at all. I'm with Rodney. I think the exact same thing. I don't like the idea of the fee. I thought we should reimburse it to begin with and or never had it. But since it's there, everybody knows the deadline. We've had a deadline. If we're gonna stick to it and this board is not gonna make a different decision, then they need to go ahead and pay it. Get over with. Or don't and you know, we'll start with the liens. Any other comments, please? Do you have your answer? Got my answer. We're going to send the card out. Send the card out. You got okay. it. So okay. that's way one. Yeah. Let me touch on a couple of other issues real quick that are, that are before us. First of all, the status on the Salado scroll, the Christmas scroll. The preparations are underway for Christmas scroll. Uh, it takes place, as you know, the first two weekends in December. Do you talk about her event? That'll be part of that event, that celebration. Uh, this year, additional portable lighting and parking signage will be placed on Main Street to enhance pedestrian safety. We sampled that last year and had pretty good reviews on that. Uh, capital excavation crews have agreed to not work on stroll weekends, and they're also going to try to minimize the impact of their heavy equipment on stroll. And lastly, as you know, we talked at the last meeting that we were surveying businesses about their thoughts about the idea of potentially closing a portion of Main Street to maybe uh, enhance public safety down there since we've got issues with darkness and we've got issues with uh, the, the various types of uh, activities taking place and, and potential conflicts uh, with, with vehicles and pedestrians. Uh, the feeling we got from the from the business owners was give us a break. And, and the feeling was that uh, they, they really were not interested at this point. There were some that were interested. There were others, the majority that the input we got back was, uh, you know, let's wait and, 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 and let's wait if at all possible, give us an opportunity to plan for it if we're gonna go there. And some flats said, just don't do it. So with that input back, also with the idea of the fact that we're going to have a lot of confusion down there with the construction piece, uh, our thought process is we're going to move forward this year with leaving the street open, uh, but next year we're going to start early next year and moving in the direction of trying to get in the direction of closing at least a portion of that street uh, to the point that we can have some more pedestrian activities, create maybe a, dip, a little bit more of a fellowship atmosphere, but also improve safety. Um, project will be done next year, which means you're going to have lots of lighting, you're going to have sidewalks. So it may actually preclude, depending on how things start to pan out, the need to even contemplate that. We still think that from a festival standpoint, a planning standpoint, 
there's a benefit to closing the course of that street to allow for some mingling of different types and some inter interchange between customers and businesses and, and people in the community uh, in, in more kind of a festive atmosphere. Uh, but that's something we'll talk about for next year and then the planning process. This year, we're going to sit back and, and just try to do what we can to keep things as safe as possible down there the way it is. So that's scrolling. Staff's report of the legislative update. We talked a little bit about this uh, last week with the, the attorney, just to let folks know that uh, the legislature took aim at cities in this last uh, session, significant aim at cities, uh, and passed a, a battery of bills uh, that, that, quite frankly, many of which were triggered by Austin and their approach towards city government. Um, and unfortunately, the other hundreds of communities uh, are having to pay that price. Uh, a couple of these issues are issues that are near and dear to this village that they've taken away from us. Uh, some of these we truly do believe, just in talking to folks, that there will be revisiting of some of these issues in the next session uh, once they see the impact that they have. Uh, probably uh, one of the benign ones, but it's something new you're going to see, is we're obligated to post some general election information on the website. Uh, we've always posted information during the election season on that, but they're asking us to keep up 365. Uh, basically information on what it takes to be able to run for office, when the next election is going to be, who your current office holders are, you know, where voting takes place, all those types of things, just basic generic information. Uh, probably one of the biggest things that's going to hit us from, from the legislative change standpoint is that we're no longer allowed to prohibit certain building materials. Uh, if the building material is allowed by the building code, then we don't have the ability legally to stop somebody from putting that metal, that metal building regardless of where it's being put up. Uh, and I think that's going to be a significant change, not just for this community, but for a number of small communities that are sensitive about their character. Uh, this is one we feel is going to get revisited pretty quick when the session comes to be in two years. Uh, the disturbing thing about this particular bill is there were actually some local builders here uh, in this area, I'll say, that actually testified in support of and advocated this particular piece of legislation. Uh, it is what it is, and you're going to be seeing a modification of the ordinance to, to come in compliance with the state law, uh, but we're going to be having to take out basically the, the building requirements we have to prohibit things like metal buildings, you know, certain types of exteriors, those types of things, uh, which are sensitive. You know, they're, they're, they're issues that we take great pride in, in, in managing the development to try to keep the character of the community the way it is. Uh, we no longer can declare a property historic uh, without the permission of the property. Uh, I don't know that that's been a practice of this city historically, uh, but that's an issue as you begin to develop the historic district that, that a lot of cities uh, have had that authority and have that power to do so, and that, and that no longer exists. Uh, the village subdivision ordinance that's going to need to be modified to reflect the new plat processing requirements. You probably read a little bit about this. Uh, basically, there are some of the larger cities in particular that have a very prolonged review process uh, to the point where it takes months sometimes for subdivisions to go through review. Not anymore. There's a 30-day window. The good news in our case is we're pretty quick on that. We're, we're normally within that 30-day window without any problems. Uh, the one thing you may see come out of this is a topic that came up in the last discussion that it was legal, and that was the idea of authority. Right now, you have flat authority under our ordinance. By law, you don't necessarily have to be the final state. P and Z can be the final state when it comes to flats and, 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 and replats and things along those lines. So I think we'll probably and when we modify this, we may bring that issue up and let you chew on that because we've got some interest from some members who said maybe that's something we ought to think about as opposed to making it that good. Uh, and then as far as annexation goes, uh, they took another shotgun blast at, at the annexation rights of, of cities. Uh, the good news from our standpoint is they're all now pretty much having to live by what we have to live with, and that is it's a voluntary annexation process. It's, it's, it's kind of a, it's kind of a, it, it, not a de facto voluntary annexation process, but the larger cities, uh, we still are only allowed to have basically voluntary annexations where they petition us. Uh, but the larger cities now, uh, where they used to be able to go force themselves on people, uh, they're now having to go to public vote. If, if there's a desire to annex a particular part of the community, there will be a public vote among those people who are going to be annexed in. This is what they want to come uh, So that's a big change for them. For us, we still have voluntary annexations. Our process really has not changed that much under that statute. So. You'll be seeing a few changes to ordinances coming forward. I wanted to give you an update on some of the uh, some of the development issues we're dealing with right now. First of all, just a note, and that is the minimum lot size task force will be presenting its recommendations to the Board of Aldermen on September the 19th. That's your next regular meeting. 
Um, you ask about subdivisions, act activity we have as far as subdivisions. Uh, this is what's on our plate right now uh, as far as active subdivisions. We've got the, the Bluffville Creek Amendment, and that's a one lot subdivision we're dealing with. Salado Mills Phase 3 is an 11 lot subdivision. Uh, Salado Mills Phase 4 is a two lot subdivision we're working right now. Uh, the Windmill Estates Phase 1 is 52 lots that we're working. The Mill Creek Springs Phase 10 is 65. We talked about that, I believe, at your last meeting. Uh, the sanctuary, of course, is 183 in phase one with one another 180, 186 stone uh, in the latter phase. And then you've got Amity phase five with 57 lots. So you've got a lot of lots coming in. Uh, uh, again, the, the really of, of these uh, sanctuaries in, inside the city, the others, uh, Mill Creek part of that is, uh, but the, the others are, are pretty much, you know, in, in the ETJ, but very, very close. Plan developments that have not yet come to our desk, but uh, we anticipate those as far as flats go, and that's Royal Street. Uh, we've been in discussion with uh, the developers there at the Village uh, West Village and Williams Road uh, about the uh, that tract property, and they're very close to putting us the concept plan on that. Uh, and then FN 2268, we've got some developments out there in the early stages, uh, some of which are outside of our ATJ, but a significant one of which is a is potential 900 lot subdivision uh, that's just outside of our ATJ that uh, more than likely is going to be looking at the mud when we reach in. But the activities there and the rooftops are coming, uh, just as everybody talked about and everybody expected. But that's all I've got there. Well, lastly, uh, two quick things. Uh, Number one, uh, all of you have gotten a letter from the Rotary Club expressing concern about uh, the playground at Pace Park. Uh, we met with the Lions Club uh, board a couple of weeks ago. And following that meeting, we went ahead and scheduled an inspection by our, by our risk uh, assessor uh, who inspects playgrounds. And we've got that playground inspect inspection scheduled for two weeks from now to take a look at that. We think we need a good assessment on that. We've told you that playground is old. We told you that playground is dilapidated. That playground probably was outdated a couple of years after it got installed. That's just the way the industry has changed. Uh, but we talked about the fact that at some point there's a need to, to replace that. We talked to the Lions Club board, and I think Rotary has interest too in helping out at Pace Park. Uh, whether it's some potentially some combined funding effort in the future, who knows? Uh, whether it's a community fund drive, who knows? But at some point in the near future, we need to get that playground replaced. We've, we've had it maintained. Uh, you know, by, by the contractor who put it in, uh, and, and who was responsible for it, should I say, and uh, it just needs to get swapped out to something that's more current and more standard with appropriate landing areas, uh, getting rid of some of the wood, those type of things to, to make it more uh, durable and easy to maintain. So you'll be hearing more about that. At the same time, we've got a contractor scheduled to go to Pace Park, and they're going to be going in next week and doing some level out work down in the grass area and knocking down and filling in some of the holes and things like that that came as a result of the last flooding so we can get down there to mow that. Uh, after that, we're going to go in and knock some bollards out, put up some, uh, put some blocks, which was part of the park improvement plan that we talked about. So we'll see some activity along those lines. Lastly, uh, you know, <laughs> we're, we're dealing with a situation right now. If you live up on Whisper and Oaks, all I can say is I'm sorry for you all and what you're having to deal with, because we're having to deal with the same grief that you're having to deal with, and that is Encore. And, and I'm not going to sit up here and blast Encore, uh, but I have been stunned in, in the last uh, three days. Uh, and I've never known an electric company that didn't have the ability to put a sign out that said caution low power line ahead or low line ahead, uh, or a company that didn't have the ability when they knew they had lines that were dangling six feet over the roadway to find the resources to go in and immediately raise the lines. Instead, what's happened is we've seen a blame game of, well, it's Grande, well, it's CenturyLink. Well, the problem is they're all along Encore's poles. And in order to raise the infrastructure, Encore's poles need to be adjusted and need to be, quite frankly, replaced. Uh, we've had a lineup in the area of Whisper Oaks and Old Mill Creek that, or Mill Creek that uh, has been hammered by high vehicles over the last month, probably three or four times. Well, it all came to roost yesterday when we had a dump truck uh, lay into the line and uh, nearly ripped the transform off the pole. And we had seven feet over the roadway. The neighbors up there have been very patient, but the patience is complete. And, and, and uh, we, we've opened some eyes. We had Encore higher ups out there today. We had Century Lincoln, we had Grandi out there. They've been able to raise the uh, neutral. Uh, up to the point that right now everything's about 14 feet 
over the roadway, that's still too low. It needs to be up in the neighborhood of 16 to 18 feet. Um, and so they've, they've indicated that they've scheduled uh, telephone repair, or excuse me, uh, uh, pole repairs, uh, you know, for the immediate future. And we told them we hope that immediate future is within the next seven days or we're going to go higher. But the problem has got to get fixed because we had an outage yesterday with the hit that took place. And all it's going to take is going to be that FedEx truck who's not paying attention to come in and take that neutral line, which is the low line out. And it's going to take down that whole area power wise, phone wise, internet wise, and it'll take a while to get it back up. So uh, if you know frustration, there is frustration, but I will tell you, I'm optimistic that we've got their attention at this point and hopefully uh, we'll move forward with it. But I just apologize for the names people are having to deal with. And please use caution. That's all I've got. Very well. Any questions that you'd like or comments to make to Don? Uh, I got a question, Don, for you. Back when you talked about building codes uh, as far as exteriors, yes. does that apply to residential or just commercial? All or both. Yeah, res residential and commercial. So if a guy built a house, he could have a metal garage? Yes. Exterior. It's allowed by the building code. We have no say so. The legislature has taken our ability to regulate building materials. If it's something that the building code does not allow, then we have the ability to regulate that. But most of the materials that we get asked about that we prohibit are things that the building code allows. We can't regulate. But, but a homeowner's, a homeowner's uh, the deed restrictions that go in and require materials, they're still valid. Correct? Absolutely. But again, we don't import deed restrictions, but you're exactly right. And we always encourage people when they're bringing building plans to check with their homeowner association to make sure that it's legit. So uh, whether they do it or not, that's their battle between them. We're just not going to be able to tell somebody. I mean, we had, for example, the barn dominium discussion uh, a couple of years ago. And you remember how contested that got. Uh, and we relied on our code in that discussion. We're going to have to modify. I think that will change. I really do truly believe that's going to change. Uh, but I think we're going to have to live with it for two years. Any other comments or questions? Yeah, I've got one more. Sure. Uh, you, you talked about um, areas that are not in our ETJ. Yes, sir. Do we have the ability to go out and grab those people, bring them into our ETJ for as future we, annexation? The thing to keep in mind is as you annex, if your ETJ line is here, okay, and you annex that property, that's at the end of your ETJ. Your ETJ extends again another mile from that standpoint. It grows as it goes, okay? And so you have you have the ability to bring them in in that fashion, or you have the ability to go out and ask them, or they have the ability actually to ask to be part of our ETJ, and we can do that. That's why we have an ETJ that looks like it got hit with a shotgun blast. If you recall, everybody discovered Colleen was working his way down the back door, and there was this mass, what, care 200 ordinances or something like that, of, of, of bringing in properties into the ETJ. They can ask to become part, but they have to be contiguous, obviously. But uh, they can ask to be part of it. But uh, normally, your ETJ grows through the annexation process. As you annex this, it extends. You annex, it extends grows out until you end up butting up against somebody else. Thank you. Yes. Other questions or comments, please? Don, I'm going to ask you two very ridiculous questions, but there's a reason for it. Number one is, did this board have anything to do with what the Texas legislature has done? Oh, no. Okay. Number two is this. If we can't annex, if, if we cannot do anything but sit here while all of those subdivisions came in that you just mentioned, the state of Texas is going to give grants for the, our infrastructure so that we can live on? Should we start something like that to start putting pressure on that? I'm telling you, $1 million is what our budget is. And, we can't support the infrastructure when you've got everybody using our stuff. And I'm not trying to be selfish or stingy. Dude, that's just plain fact. Let me, let me say this about that. And, and that is, 
and we've talked about a little about this situation. We it's real easy to get stuck on rooftops and, and the benefit of rooftops. It's important that as you develop that you focus on misuse development, mixed use additions to your community, translation, commercial developments with the commercial element, in addition to a residential element. But you know, to the point where you're you're getting a mix, like you're fixing to see on the Williams Road development at West Village. That's going to be a mixed development. There will be a commercial piece, and then there's going to be a residential piece. The reason I say that, Mayor, is this, and that is you're going to get far more stable dollars out of the commercial piece than you are off the rooftop. The rooftop demands more service, number one. But number two, the rooftops end up costing you money. When the commercial development really doesn't cost you money, you, you benefit from that. Yeah. So, so that needs to be the focus as opposed to example, looking at our shops over a 900 lot subdivision. If that was a 500 lot subdivision with some frontage commercial that generates sales tax revenue and property tax revenue, far exceeds what you get off a home, something to think about. Well, it is. And Especially I, when you're sitting on the interstate. I've heard that argument many times, but still. Oh, it's frustrating. It's, it's very frustrating for the next 10 or 15 years. It truly really is. All right, now the second thing, it's. Our understanding is the last communication we had with them, which was about, oh, 10 days ago, and that was, they were scheduled to try to break around on the 15th, so yes. Okay. Last thing I want to just say still is no word on when the commercial plant comes. I listened very carefully to what you said about the line and the truck that hit it. And I'm talking about now, I'm talking now not as a mayor, but I'm talking as a citizen who pays taxes and all of that. We have got to do something about getting a truck permit so that we can't have all these large, huge rock trucks and everything else coming down narrow ways. We're, that's as dangerous as golf course. Yep. And I'd really like to put that on a workshop and let's put this thing out. We'll put it on the 19th, absolutely. It, it worked. Okay, thank you. So you know, in that case, a large percentage of the vehicles that have hit that line were a FedEx truck, they were in garbage trucks and things like that. So they're, they're standard vehicles that are in, that are in our, yeah, we, we did get with the dump truck this week. But you're exactly right. Not just there do we have problems with large trucks, we have several places and they're hitting our infrastructure hard. Okay, any other questions to Don? Now that was a great report, I tell you what, that's an eye-opening report. Well, I our, one more thing I want to ask though, along the mayor's comment about BTJ. What's stopping somebody from coming the other way down if they annex up to a property that's not an OETJ? Well, the legislature did you a benefit in the last two sessions. Believe it or not, they did some positive for small cities. And that is, they have pretty much neutered annexation for larger cities. Before larger cities, I could say, I could wake up tomorrow morning if I were Belton, and if you were Jason to me, I could say, you know what, John, I want you in my city, and you're in my city, you can't do anything to stop it. Now, John has to vote to agree to come into my city. We've received communication with Belton that they have pretty much 86 to any type of future annexation plans. Cities aren't going to do that because there aren't many communities in many areas in Texas that are going to voluntarily say, take me into your tax system. They're out in the rural areas because they want to get away from city government and want to get away from taxation and want to live without regulation. And so, hence the reason now this, this public vote exists and there are very few cities now are saying, we're just, annexation is almost a thing of the past. Unless it's voluntary, like we have, we're, we're lucky in that sense. Any other comments, please? Well, Mr. Chief of Police, can you talk what Don just did? Uh, probably not. Probably not. I think I got all the month uh, the months fixed on this one, so I should be good to go. Okay, last month, uh, 329 service calls. 
They had 18 reports, three supplements, had two arrest warrants issued. Uh, had, uh, we wrote 33 citations. Uh, that's down from last month. We're working on a few things with our, we were working on some ticket writing issues. Uh, we had seven warnings last month and we had two arrests. Uh, look at our calls for service. They're pretty much staying consistent. And again, I believe once we get our fully staffed, we're almost fully staffed and everyone out in training, uh, those will increase a little bit because we'll be starting to cover more hours. Sorry. So traffic citations down. Uh, vehicle crash is about the same. It's just, you know, depend on, I'm just dreading the first rain or first major rain we have, they'll go up. Our response times for priority one. Last month it was an unusual month, but we didn't have, I think last month we only had like one or two priority one calls. Uh, this past month they were, they went up a little bit. So we will right back to about the, the norm. Same thing with priority twos went down a little bit, about two minutes and priority threes also went down as well. Uh, with our COPS program, uh, there's several things we're preparing for. Uh, going to get volunteers to help out. We have the Grape Stomp coming out at the end of this month. Serena Festival and Parade, they're going to help out with some of the traffic control with my officers, uh, also the gathering, and then we have the stroll coming up in December. So the next couple months, several months, are going to be quite busy for the COPS. Uh, we did, they did assist me with updating our contact list for all of our businesses to make sure our phone numbers are correct. So if we have to call somebody when their business has been left unsecure, we can contact them. Uh, and just so, because we, we promoted this pretty hard on um, Facebook, that we're doing uh, house watches. Uh, my officers are being very diligent and uh, going through these. And uh, we served, we did 188 house watches, not 188 houses, but the houses that had house watches, they're doing them at least once a shift. So you may get them two, three times, four times a day. Uh, and Officer Dunchy was recognized by a citizen in the newspaper for scaring the homeowner who put the wrong date on and Chris showed up and scared him. So, but he appreciated it. Uh, we got national night coming out October 1st. Uh, Johnny's Outback is going to allow us their use of their facility to do a national night out. I got with the Mill Creek Association with uh, Laura Zubek and uh, she's going to, we're going to combine forces to do that uh, together. So uh, it'll be six to 9 PM. Uh, fire department will be there. Um, my officers will be there. Speaking of officers, uh, we have Officer Sean Miller in the house. He's right there. He's our new officer. He'll be released on his own here shortly. And Officer John Oster, he'll start on Monday. He's our school resource officer. Sean Miller came from, uh, he's retired from Weatherford PD and also TABC. Um, been in the job for about 30 years now. John is a former, we were MPs together from about 25, 26 years ago. But he's re he retired last week from Coppers Cove after uh, 21 and a half years, and he's been their school resource officer for the last three and a half years. So little train up that we have to do. He's already um, well aware of the resource officer position. So I'd like to welcome John and Sean. So. <laughs> Questions, comments, concerns? Questions? No question. Yes, sir. We got we're fully staffed now for 24 seven hours. Yes, to a point to try to avoid overtime. There'll be some lag, but for the most part, we'll, we'll be so, covering everything. So if we lose one officer for vacation or sick day, whatever, then we're. Yeah, we're back to the same boat. Yes, sir. So prudent to have one more officer. If we had one more, we'd be able to have the, uh, like a basically a power watch or somebody that could fill in and have overlaps on the busy times of the night. Yes, sir. So we wouldn't be overstaffed. Other comments or questions? Pat, I want to thank you very much because uh, you know, one of the complaints that we've gotten in the past years was very simply, where are our policemen? We don't ever see them on the streets. We don't see them driving around. Most of the time, they beat me to get into the place, and they're already there. And when we do cops, citizens on patrol, and we find that door open, we make a phone call, and they're there within 10 minutes. They don't have any telephone numbers to call, but they're there, and that's good. But thank you very much because health and welfare is extremely important for this community. Yes, thank sir. You. Appreciate it. Shane's not here, so he told me to give his presentation. Yeah. Serious. He wanted me to remind you that they're doing their 50 
13th from uh, 5 to 8 p.m. It's a, one of their big fundraisers. We appreciate them coming out, everybody coming out and helping them out with their fundraisers, the way they support their fire department, our fire department. And I'll, I'll tell you, as a, being a police officer coming from a larger city, uh, compared to large city police or fire departments, these guys are Johnny on the spot. They're, they get out there being a volunteer fire department, and sometimes they're there faster than I would have seen other departments. I'm not going to name them. You know where I work, so. But. And there, there is a burn ban in effect. I'd like to remind everybody of that. Please don't be lighting any fires. We don't need to deal with that out in the county. They're dealing with that every day. So, you good? Thank you very much. I was going to make a presentation for Shane, but no. I was told no. Thank you. Our tourism. How are you doing, Chad? Doing well yourself. Yeah, I think so. Awesome. Um, so, quick overview um, on everything going on in my world. Uh, as, as you can see, the visitor center um, still seeing the general trend of, um, of visitation in the visitor center, but it is uh, still up from last year. Um, social media growth is still going strong. Uh, Facebook got a little bit more. Uh, hopefully, this line. My goal, obviously, is to get this line to be more uh, steep. So we'll see if that happens over the next couple of months. Um, I mentioned last time about digital marketing and how sort of the some of the metrics were going. Um, I just wanted to give you some good overview on on uh, generally speaking, um, how many people have seen our ad, that sort of thing. Um, ad has been shown or ads been play market uh, over four million times. Uh, to <laughs> to show you how little people click on ads, um, it's fourteen thousand clicks, but that's fourteen that almost fifteen or. 14,400 people who would not have otherwise gone to our website. Uh, we drove them to our website, engaged them with um, with Salado and what we have to offer, that sort of thing. Uh, and then 4,200 of those people um, actually stayed on the website and were heavily engaged, kicking on different pages and exploring uh, the site. Um, and then so to talk about it, um, those numbers in more detail and about what they mean um, and to see if they're effective, um, to give you some perspective on what I can use to, to gauge success is uh, from the fiscal year, uh, 2018, or 2018 fiscal year, um, there were 176 rooms in the market with 120,000 in revenue uh, in the city revenue uh, for those uh, hotel taxes. The following year, the same period, there was 224 rooms, increase of rooms, but also an increase in revenue, 188,000, which is expected. Uh, but the number of rooms um, increased 27%, but the amount of revenue increased double that. Um, and so um, that kind of shows that, you know, rooms are growing. Yes, revenue is going to increase, but revenue increased far more than the number of rooms did. Um, and so things seem to be working and moving in the right direction. Um, and just an overview on some upcoming events this month. Um, in September, we've got, or later this month, we've got the uh, Sledo Culinary Festival, formerly the Chocolate and Wine. I've um, been focusing a lot on that these last couple of weeks and um, going to be focusing these next couple of weeks uh, coming up on that. Uh, part of that is a grape stomp. And then, of course, uh, every month, just so you all are aware, uh, something that I'm trying to wrap my head around how to bring together um, uh, the two events of Sip and Shop and Raw. They both happen on the same day. Um, they're on two different parts of town, so I see um, us as being the perfect uh, uh, people to rally those events together and talk about all the great things there are going on uh, to start that fourth weekend uh, of the month. And then October, we've got Syrian Fest and Christmas in October right after that, so that'll help us lead into the holiday season. Um, we've got a busy time coming up. We do. Any questions or comments, please, to Chad? I have, hey. one, I have so, one, Chad. Can you back up to your bar graph? Okay, by the way. Right. The next okay. one. Where do you see this peaking? Where, Where do I see it peaking? Think? I mean, technically, there's no peak. Um, at some point, we've. Uh, the other numbers we look at are engagement. As social media growth grows and you have more followers, 
typically engagement's gonna go down. So our followers are really engaged right now. There's a smaller amount of followers and more of them are more engaged with the stuff that we're posting and things that we're doing. Um, as that amount of followers increases, typically engagement starts to flatten out. That's when we have to get creative with, you know, um, engaging different, you know, businesses in the community um, and, and doing, you know, uh, contests or things like that. Um, um, one of the things that I'm working on is, is uh, like an artist spotlight kind of deal um, where basically we'll um, once a month or twice a month, we'll talk about an artist and, and about their life and about how they became who they are and what about what, what it is that they want to say about their art. So, and, and that's a big thing about social media is it, it's people want to see pictures. Yes, they want to see cool things to do, but they kind of, it's, it's another one of those things with general trend of, of travel in general, we want to feel connected. Uh, and so trying to make Salado have more of a personality um, through social media is going to be the key. Um, we can only post so much before the growth is going to start flattening out. At some point, we've got to get creative with, you know, and, and we are, but um, other cities, bigger, bigger places with bigger following, they have more resources. Uh, they have social media marketing companies that do all of this for them. So we just have to pay attention to what's what people are responding to and, and that sort of thing. So, so expanding the proactive mode. Totally, yeah. Thank you. Other questions or comments, please? Charlie, thank you very much for a, a very eye-opening report. Of course, thank you. These have been done excellent reports. Generally. Okay. We're going into a public hearing. There's two of them. Let me tell you a little bit about the public hearing. In both of these, the village administrator will fill you in on what the public hearing is about. When he has concluded this, I will take us out of this session and we will go into a public hearing session. When we get into the public hearing session, that's your opportunity to speak. Three minutes up here where you live, and any comment you want to make. I'll do it like this. Call number one. Call number two. Call number three. If no one comes up at that time, I proclaim that we're out of a public hearing and we'll come back into the regular session, or we might just stay in the public hearing and go to B. That's how it works. All right, public hearing A. Hold a public hearing regarding the proposed fiscal year 2020 operating budget for the village of Salado, Texas. Don? Uh, yes, sir. Mayor, uh, members of the council, as you know, uh, we talked about this uh, at our last meeting. Uh, so if you would uh, bear with me, I'd like to run through the presentation again very quickly uh, about the, what we went through at the last meeting. Uh, this is uh, the operating budget that the mayor is obligated to bring forward and file with the city secretary. A, uh, an operating budget which kind of serves as the, the guiding light uh, for the development the final approval of a, an operating budget for the, for the village of Salado. Our particular budget consists of several uh, funds. Uh, we have a general fund which funds our city's general operations, the police department, administration, streets, public works, parks, those kind of things. Then we have a hotel motel tax fund, and in that particular fund uh, is a restricted use fund, which means dollars generated from the room tax go into that fund and they fund the tourism activities that the cabinet just talked about. They also have the ability to fund some arts activities, which I think is good. Uh, wastewater fund uh, is, is exactly what it says. It's basically a fund that is uh, uh, used to basically fund the operation of our new wastewater system, uh, revenue generated from monthly service fees that goes towards the, uh, the uh, operation cost of, of that particular facility. And as you know, we have impact fees and things like that that can go help retire capital costs too. Uh, the interest in sinking fund is, is related to our debt fund, uh, you know, our debt service on, on the wastewater bonds that were approved. Uh, so, so you can see the funds that exist right now. And uh, what is being proposed in the mayor's budget basically uh, is, is an increase in spending. Uh, and we'll talk about that. In the general fund, there's a proposed 19% increase, basically going from $1.1 million to uh, $1.3 million. So we'll talk about where those cost increases are in just a few moments. And the hotel motel tax fund. Uh, there is a, an increase from 212000 to 222000 about 5% jump. But the wastewater fund is going from ninety-seven dollars to $209,000. You said, my Lord, what happened? 
Well, keep in mind, you, you now have a wastewater system, whereas before you had a, a very small uh, plant that had five or seven customers on it. Uh, so the operating costs obviously are vastly different uh, versus the system that's designed to serve over 130 properties. The interest of sinking fund, you see a slight increase with that. Uh, the total, when you look at the total of all the funds combined, uh, we're up about 16% from 2.1 million to 2.5 million. So let's look at where the, the, the spending changes are, some of the highlights in each of these funds. First of all, uh, for the general fund, in the expenditure column, uh, there's a 3.5% pay adjustment for all employees with the exception of my position, and there's no pay increase for me in that particular position. Uh, it's a pretty standard uh, rate that we've seen across the market so far, uh, and, and so to, to know the cost of that is about $16,000. Uh, we include a student resource officer who you met tonight, uh, and that cost uh, $66,000. Keep in mind a percentage of his cost gets reimbursed from the school district and their local agreement we have. We've included money in here for a public restroom trailer uh, that will be located on Main Street. It's $40,000. Uh, understand it's not going to look like a trailer. Uh, it has wheels on it, but you can take the wheels off and plant it and skirt it and make it look however you want to make it look. But uh, it'll uh, be very nice with air conditioning, heating, it could even have potential music in it uh, with, with uh, you know, different types of uh, tops and, and things like that. To, Decorate even more. Street improvements, we've got some $10,000 budget for street improvements, local drainage improvements, some $30,000 to deal with neighborhood drainage issues uh, that we have uh, dealing with, for example, Chisholm Trail we'll talk about. Uh, tree maintenance, we've got $10,000 budget for that. Uh, fire department contract, that number jumps to 10 after the last discussion we had. Uh, we originally had $5,000 increase in there. Uh, the suggestion was let's give them 10,000 more. The fire chief came up to me after the meeting and said, do not give me $10,000 more. We only need $5,000 more. So we found $5,000 in the budget. Uh, we've taken $2,500 of that out of the audit professional services line and the other 2,500 comes out of streets. We don't think that'll have a negative impact on that. Uh, one additional police vehicle uh, and at least purchase of uh, $15,000 a year. This is how our general fund expenses break out. Uh, you can see uh, the public safety represents a lion's share uh, from standpoint largely those are personnel costs that, that go into that uh, followed by administration and then of course parks goes in there and, and you can also see the area that's in there for streets being purple. General fund revenue highlights. Uh, there's a 20% increase that uh, budgeted in sales tax revenue. We have taken an extremely conservative approach towards budgeting on sales tax in years past. Uh, you do so out of concern because uh, if, you get, if you get enough and your fund balance starts building, that's great. You don't want to throw all your big, all your eggs into, into the basket and push that revenue estimate high. That's a, that's a key element in our budget uh, from, from a standpoint of, of the sales tax revenue and, and the percentage in our, in our revenue stream. Uh, we've got a history we've developed over the last couple of years uh, that we feel comfortable maybe moving that number up a little bit more than we normally would in the past. Uh, we still have left some uh, conservative uh, shadow on this, uh, but we've got a 20% increase uh, recognized based on the trends we've been seeing and the projections we've seen over the next five years. A 62% increase in property tax revenue, 6.2%, a 17% increase in mixed beverage tax revenue, a 17% increase in electric franchise fees, uh, maybe more once they get their lines. A 33% increase in building permit fees and a 5% increase in the municipal core revenues. We've been conservative on that. Again, we do not balance our budget. Uh, with municipal court fees, and I think it's important that people understand that. That's prohibited by state law, so we're not the city that does that. Uh, this is how the revenues break out. If you look at it, tax revenue, of course, being a, a big player, sales tax being second behind, and the others follow. The hotel motel fund, we call those hot funds, obviously an acronym. A 4.8% increase in room tax revenues is projected this year, and that's based on the trend we saw this year with Stagecoach now online and the potential for more rooms being added to Stagecoach hopefully in the next 12 to 18 months. We'll find out maybe a little bit more about that tomorrow in the meeting with them. Uh, we, we feel comfortable with these numbers uh, based also on the bookings and, and the results of the tourism marketing that we've seen. A 3.5% pay adjustment for the director. Uh, that goes along the line with what the rest of the staff is being uh, proposed for. Uh, $2,300, $400, or excuse me, $23,400 allocated uh, for a part Visitor Center trolley drive. Right now, he drives the trolley on Saturdays, but quite frankly, it's, it's not a bad deal for him because he gets out and gets to visit with people in the community and feel for where they're coming from and get an idea about what brought them to the community. 
Uh, $70,000 earmarked for tourism marketing campaign this year, same numbers last year. And this year we've allocated some money for the Arts and Cultural District. As you know, uh, just a couple of months back, we uh, basically became the point of contact base of, of that district with the state. And so we've allocated money in the room tax budget for this this year. Uh, it's pretty significant. You say, what are you going to spend that money on? This money is earmarked to try to design the wayfinding signage to get a jump on the next grant for wayfinding signage from the Texas Commission on the Arts. So uh, we think it's a good expenditure. If we have some money left over in the design, we, we may even start the actual uh, construction installation of some wayfinding signs, some new signs. Uh, high fund expenses, you can see how they break out, personnel, uh, and then of course uh, marketing being the secondary. Wastewater fund budget. Again, these numbers are skewed. You've got to consider the fact that we're funding the seven member system versus 130 property system now. Uh, we've got a $177,000 increase in our monthly service fee revenues, uh, an $80,000 increase in maintenance and operation costs, uh, a $21,000 increase in electric costs, a much bigger plant than the old stagecoach plant, I should say, a $10,000 increase in sludge removal costs, uh, no rate increases proposed in the monthly service fees for wastewater customers for the coming year, no general fund operating subsidy is projected. Uh, there is a general fund allocation that should go towards some of the debt service reduction, but nothing towards the operation of the plan. And then FY2020 is the first year of operations of note that the uh, new village insulator wastewater system will be in place the first full year. Here's how the numbers break out. Obviously, the lion's share of your operating costs are going to be running the system, and that's in large part uh, directed at the treatment plan operation itself. That's a very labor-intensive operation. Interest and sinking fund, uh, note 1.4% increase in property tax revenue, $10,678 uh, is what that represents, 2.8% increase in the uh, 2015 principal payment, about $10,000, 4.7% decrease in the 2015 uh, interest payment of $10,437, 47% increase in the 2018 uh, principal payment of 35, 25% decrease in the 2018 issue of 24462 a decrease in debt service rate will be proposed. And that's what I wanted to talk to you about. But we talked at, uh, we talked at our workshop session several weeks ago about the uh, desire among everybody to try to bring the debt service rate down. Uh, right now, the, the, the budget as proposed, proposed, take, proposed taking the city's uh, property tax rate to the rollback limit. And that is the maximum limit that we could raise that without setting ourselves up for a public vote on the property tax uh, that, that's being proposed. Uh, in looking at the situation, what we've gone back in and looked at the numbers, and, and we'd like to take that rate from the rollback rate, the total tax rate from the rollback rate, down to the effective tax rate, which basically is the tax rate that will generate the same amount of revenue as last year, uh, with this year's values. Uh, we think that's a benefit from a, from a property taxpayer standpoint. Uh, that decrease would come in, in the uh, debt service rate. Uh, and, and what we've done is we've gone in and, and been proposing to basically reduce the debt service rate about 9%. We take it from a 0 0.4065, which is what's proposed in the mayor's budget. We take that number down to 0 0.3692, um, you know, which would basically uh, require an infusion of about $71,000 to go back into uh, that, that from some source. Uh, we have capital impact fees, impact fees that the, the purpose of those fees in large part is to go towards debt service reduction. And uh, we'd like to take uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of about $41,000 of their debt service fees and add that to the $30,000 that's in the budget already to go towards uh, bringing that tax rate down a little bit uh, for this year. As you know, our goal is to try to keep that rate and keep a downward direction of that rate for years to come. Uh, and then once we get more additional customers in, additional service revenue in, uh, any excess service revenues we're able to, to bring in that they go over and above operating costs, we can use that revenue to go towards uh, also further debt reduction on the debt side. Uh, so, th so that's what we're looking at. So if you look at the tax rate, let me show throw this chart up here and show you these, these numbers. This, this slide is based on the mayor's rollback budget, but I've added the two numbers in to show you what the revised tax rate would look like. Uh, we still keep the M&O rate at 0 0.2070. Uh, just so you know, the, the additional revenue on the M&O side uh, from going from uh, Effective MO tax rate to the rollback MO tax rate uh, generates a, a, about $28,000 is all it does. Our tax rate is pretty low. In fact, we'll still probably end up being the lowest MO tax rate uh, in the village, or excuse me, in, in Bell County, uh, however we end up landing. Uh, where well, the change would come that we're proposing tonight uh, for consideration, we'll still work the numbers. We took another hearing and approval ago. Uh, 
Uh, we're looking at taking the debt rate from 4065 down to 3682, uh, which would leave us with a total property tax rate of 5752, which is the effective tax rate, uh, which, which I think is, is worth noting. So, Mayor, that's the briefing on it. Well, the first hearing, as you know, is on the budget, and then you'll close that and you'll go next to a, a public hearing on the tax rate. So we have questions to Don, please. Our comments. Don, if we drop the effective or drop the tax rate down to the effective rate this year, next year's rollback rate will be what is this year's effective rate, right? Should be close to that. Close to. You run the the run the, the risk you run is and it's it's kind of a dangerous slope. Uh, from a future standpoint, and that is that, you know, it's great to stand up and brag that you've lowered taxes, and I'm all about bringing taxes down to you, but you sometimes can cut yourself short if you're not careful. So you need to be, you need to try to get it down and try to keep it down, but, but careful that you don't set your starting point up at the point that you start damaging your ability, damaging your ability to provide service in the future because of an inability to raise the property tax. Keep in mind, next year we're under that new provision. Uh, as far as the, the legislature's changes on the tax laws, all of those going to affect next year. Uh, and how that totally impacts us at this stage of the game is up to interpretation based on the folks that see the money. I may have my numbers backwards, but is there any issue with arbitrage? Should not be. Are we anywhere close? No. Last check. Okay. That's last check. Other comments or questions to Don? We got one, sir. You got street improvement at sixty thousand dollars. What do we get for sixty thousand bucks? You you get big street or two to get improved. Uh, what we've done historically on that, John, is we have worked in a local agreements with the county to have them come in and, and, and improve certain roads. We have a street committee that will meet and bring forth recommendations to you in this coming year's budget to identify streets to be done. What they've done in the past is a number of streets. Uh, I will tell you that there's some of some of the work that they did last year. On Indian Trail needs to get repaired uh, because they've had some lifting of the material because of heat and because of large quick driving on it. Uh, garbage trucks in particular grimy. Uh, but uh, what you'll do is you'll get a recommendation uh, to, to come forward to identify several streets and then we'll get quotes from the county and go from there. You're not obligated to use the county to do all your work. The county has a good deal and we have a good arrangement with them. It's a good partnership. But the county does not do asphalt. The county does chip seals. So if there's a desire to do an asphalt overlay, that's something we would need to contract out. Okay. And then also drainage. Who and then you're you're talking drainage in front of homes, no doubt. We're talking with this type of money, you're talking local drainage. Okay. And, and we've never allocated money for local drainage. And, and what we would do in that situation is we have several areas that are identified based on history, in particular recent history that we got a real good glimpse of uh, just quite frankly about six or seven months ago. During the heavy rains and the history of complaints and talking with neighbors. Uh, we've got one gentleman here from Chisholm Trail who's got a problem that's, that's at his doorstep. That, quite frankly, we need to get him to clear some ditches out. We need to get some things properly sized. Uh, we're going to be working with the, the, the state on trying to do something with the interstate drainage problem that's going into Stagecoach Circle uh, and, and deal with some of those. But yeah, we're talking mainly what I would call these, John, local drainage projects. We talked during the budget uh, discussions in the past, and that is. At some point, this city can't wait much longer. At some point, we're going to need to expend the capital necessary to do a regional drainage study uh, to the point that we can start looking at maybe some large drainage projects uh, and some regional drainage projects to help minimize some of the water coming into our community, uh, but also some of the water that builds up in our community. Okay, the last thing is tree trimming. Um, well, those are trees hanging over the road. Yeah, that's right away. We started that program last year. We continued it this year. Uh, and, and, and it's an annual allocation you're going to be making. Okay. Could, could, is, that, is that the village responsibility or is that the responsibility of the resident? So far, I trim way. my own trees. Well, you, you do. And, and, and let me tell you something. It, it, it's, it's a situation to the point that there are some cities that require people to trim their own trees. So that's not an uncommon situation. Uh, our feeling is this, and that is if we have the ability to do it and to avoid conflict and to get it done, instead of wrestling and sending compliance notices and those type of things, uh, and getting into issues and delaying the work that needs to be done. Uh, our feeling is that we will trim the right away up to, up to the property line and don't go any further. We will work with property owners if they want it trimmed by their own contractor. We'll step back and let their contractor do it. People have some hopes that we're protective of, and, and we 
work very well with them. We communicate very well with them. Uh, but uh, you know, our feeling is we had this discussion, uh, you know, a year ago when we initiated the program, two years ago when we initiated the program, that was we felt like we would need to step up and start doing it instead of waiting. And I will tell you that, that tree trimming is an issue, and we can spend we can spend a hundred thousand dollars a year trimming trees in this town, and we would still not have everything done that needs to get done. Any other questions or comments to I do. So looking back through the budget, I was just doing some math calculations over here, and we have eighty two thousand over eighty two thousand dollars in pay increases. That's not adding positions. That's just increases. We've been hit really hard um, over justifying, already justifying salaries. Um, on social media, you know, that's one of the big things is talking about salaries. And last you, year. Let me ask you this. Where do you get $82,000 from? The 3.5% increase is only $16,000. And then you got the uh, tourism Please budget. chief increase. Well, that was, that's. The salary increases that are proposed in this year's budget, his salary is, it increased this year when we hired the police chief. His salary went up at that point. Salary yeah. increases that are proposed are only a 3.5% increase of all the board. I'm just looking at the budget that we've got that's in front of us yeah. right here, where it goes from 56 to 77. That was when he got, he got hired at 75, I think, something like that, when he got hired. So... What you're seeing is his base salary without the increase would still be 75. That's not an increase proposed this year. That was increased this year when he got hired. Okay. Um, and I know that you said that you were not accepting a pay increase, but it has on here that it is. And I think it's just, it's a clarification. No, issue. Hang, hang on. Hang on one second. There is no salary increase budget for this year. So what, what, you're is, seeing, what you're seeing is an increase from the original budget last year to FY19 versus FY20. Right. With the, the FY20 budget, my salary is, they increased the salary last year, the board did following my valuation. But there's no budget, there's no pay increase for my position budget okay. for this year. If the board chooses to do that next later in the year, they can do that. It's something that's y'all's choice, not mine. Okay. So when we're going down this line item that's on this the far right the yeah. far right column, mm -hmm. where are the numbers that you're talking? Because those numbers, whenever I calculated it up, it's eighty three thousand dollars. So if that's wrong, I think all of us are looking at the wrong numbers, or at least I am. <laughs> let, me, let me let me show you where you got. So you're at a if you go into uh, what is proposed. Mm -hmm. Best one to look at is uh, you've got the the uh, approved budget, and then you have the year-to-date budget, and then the proposed budget. Okay, mm -hmm. and if you look at the village administrator salary, let's just use mine for an example. It went from the approved budget of one fifteen five hundred to mm -hmm. one twenty two one thirty eight. Mm -hmm. Okay, what that will not show in here, but you will soon see that the amended budget, which you always do at the last meeting which proves up the amendments that were made during the year, it will reflect an adjustment in my salary up to that 122, 138. There's no increase proposed for my for my salary in this. So year. when do I when do we see that? Uh, you'll see that when you get that approved at, at, the, at your next meeting on the 19th. Okay. So you'll see the increase itself that, that, that the staff increase is proposed as far as the salaries go, it equates to like 16,000 when you look at salary plus benefits mm -hmm. it equates to like sixteen thousand dollars on the administrative side and on the tourism side i think it's something like two thousand dollars something like that okay. there were no there were no adjustments made that the, the budget amendments that you all made relating to salaries this year were a pay increase that was granted to me by this board we hired uh we made a, a, a school resource officer we bumped him into a corporal's position from that right. standpoint we left officers pay uh, the same, um, and then we had the sergeant's pay, but uh, that, that was, and then the chief's pay. So, I mean, you had some, you had probably the biggest jump pay wise was the chief's salary. I guess, like, I don't know, I feel like I've been doing this for a really long time, and so it makes me feel like I 
I've been looking at it incorrectly oh, no, because right. this, like, why, why would we go off of this, these numbers, if these are not the right ones? They are the right numbers. The, you, you have not amended the budget yet. The, you've, not, you've not approved the final amended budget. The final amended budget will take into account uh, the changes that you've made in this fiscal year. Okay. So you'll see, you'll see when you see the final amended budget, uh, the chief salary will go from 55 to 75 or something like that. Uh, mine goes, I think, up a couple thousand dollars. Uh, you'll see the school resource officer in there. Is that a, is that, that percent, that three and a half percent, is that a kind of like a statewide thing? Is that what, for instance, like the oh, state got this year? Because we got 1.4 no, yeah, with I, I the would, federal government. I will tell you that, that uh, I'm not looking at school, the school's got a lot more, and it's because of the state legislature and what they did with the school funding. But mm -hmm. I will tell you a lot of cities in this area are in that ballpark of three and three and a half. Any other questions or comments to Don? Yeah. Uh, we, we got the public works guy. Okay. What does he do? Does he have a, hmm. a, an agenda or, I mean, I, I very rarely see the guy. Well, let me tell you what he does. He's responsible for setting the park up for park events, uh, cleaning the park on a regular basis, mowing. He does a lot of mowing. He does a lot of street patching. Um, and, you know, he also assists with managing the trimming crews. Those type of things, so he's pretty busy. Quite frankly, that could be a two-person department very easily. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions or comments, please. There are a lot of there are a lot of things we'd like to get done in that department that we don't just because of the funding issues. Uh, for example, if we had a second body, we, we really need to get into street sign replacement. Uh, you know, we, we need to get into uh, culvert cleanings, those type of things. Uh, but he probably, if I were to guess, he spends probably 60% of his time mowing, probably 30% of his time being on the streets, those type of things, and maybe 10% on the park. Okay, so along the line of mowing, but uh, back in the street department where you've got, I guess, 5,000 5, allocated for the mowing, is that yes. uh, above what he does? Is that that's mowing, uh, that's, that's actually this maintenance and mowing is basically maintaining the gate sign, gateway signs that we assume is possible. When we put the signs in, we took responsibility for maintenance of those. They got to be weeded on a regular basis and then areas around the mow. Yes, above and beyond what yeah. he does. Yeah. I'm just and, trying to understand. And one of, the reasons, one of the reasons we do that, John, is the fact that I'd rather have a contractor out there working on the interstate. They have the equipment. They have the equipment, and they've got uh, they've got that that skill set that we're not equipped to handle. Okay. okay. On Salado Plaza, the uh, is that sixty thousand going to be able to take care of all the uh, I call them speed bumps? Keep everybody from driving us fast down the Plaza. Getting started on that road. Uh, that road needs to be concrete. As long as we're going to allow trucks to drive on that road, that road needs to be concrete. And uh, to concrete that road, the estimates we've received were staggered from that standpoint. The thought process has been given to doing sections of it in, in concrete. Uh, in particular, where we're seeing the grinding that takes place, um, you know, in the course of course, the course is uh, the concrete patch that we put in as a sample has worked relatively well. We're seeing some failure though now on the south side of that roadway that didn't exist before. Uh, I wasn't here when that road got built and, and, and you know, I don't know how they built it. I don't know who oversaw the, the work that was done on it and, and what type of base uh, repair was done prior to the work and those type of things. But that said, at some point that road needs some serious attention and it needs some serious dollars. And how are we going to fix it? You know, I think I think we, we need to decide the approach we want to take first. And, you know, I think probably one of the first approaches is, and we've talked about this back when Alderman McDougall was here, was, was getting with folks at the Plaza and Brookshire's to talk to their delivery people about routing them into the parking lot in some form or fashion. They have a stable parking lot in that area. 
that they can handle. And we see some of the trucks over there right now. I saw one last night, as a matter of fact, at 11 o'clock in there, driving into the parking lot and then making their way to grocers to get there. Uh, so managing that truck traffic a little bit better, I think, is, is something that needs to be done. And that may fall in line with what the mayor is talking about in the way of some type of truck permit. I think the, the, the next approach towards that situation is uh, sitting down and, and doing, a, doing an analysis to see whether it's, it's fiscally better for us to go in and literally section out the, the sections and, and improve those sections uh, and, and do some concrete work there in some of the key sections, not just a patch here or there in concrete. Uh, and then the other section comes down to look at, looking at literally going in there and, and, and doing a scare box and, and read the truck and, and do it right. Uh, there's, there's, some, there's some interesting soil mixes and you've got some, you've got some groundwater intrusion that, that is complicating some of those roadsides, some of the ditches that I don't think were addressed back when the original work was done. Um, you know, yeah, groundwater sometimes, as you will know, sometimes pops up, you know, when you, when you never expect it, even when you look for it. But uh, there are some groundwater issues that are known over there now that we need to look at uh, in whatever we do. Uh, so I think you got, I think you've got an initial regulation effort that you should try, you know, towards, towards managing the truck traffic. And then I think we need to make the decision on whether we want to do it uh, and only repair those key sections or whether we want to look at putting money away and doing the whole road at some point. Well, right now, right now the uh, that road is pretty much unacceptable. Absolutely it is. So the, the need on it is immediate, not one month, three months, or two years down the road. No, I think you're I think you're right. And I think I think to be honest with you, I think the concrete pieces are a temporary fix. Because I think at the end of the day, reconstruction makes all the sense. We we got some estimates back when we were looking at that originally, and you were you were north of two hundred thousand dollars to do that road. You know that work wasn't done that long ago. I do not understand why there's no warranty on that. And I know they said it's because the deficiencies are in different places every time, but they they engineered that. We paid for that to be done, and so it seems like they they had a failure with their engineer or their paving or wherever the failure is. It probably isn't a hundred percent, but they ought to give it. They, we ought to have some sort of warranty. That road was failing when I got here. It was when failing a month after yeah. they put it in. And that's when you call the warning in, and that's when you push that situation. But also, it comes down to contract management. I don't know who manages the contract when they build it. They hired somebody. So engineers don't fail. The head of the contract, especially once my hand That's it. <laughs> he says those fail extremely. Any more questions or comments? No, Mayor, but let me let me jump back on Amber's Amber's questions. I think her questions are good questions, but you'll you'll see when you see the amended budget, the changes that were made this year, that'll show the reflection. But we're not we're not proposing eighty thousand dollars salary increase. Well, I think where the problem is on here that I'm not getting is I have the amended 2018 budget. The approved 2019 budget and the year amended, to date, yeah. but there's no amended current year budget on here. So the, I don't know were, what the amended numbers were. Yeah, what you do is you do that's that's a year in cleanup item as Joe do the last meeting where we go in and do a final amended budget and it'll reflect those changes. So yeah, it's this city is you know, I, I will tell you from a standpoint of, of uh, personnel costs. What people do not understand is we're pretty conservative in the world of personnel. I know there are some people in this town that like the comparison shop. I think it's very difficult to comparison shop because you're looking at different qualifications, you're looking at different experience, you're also looking at different workloads. And I think that uh, from a standpoint of this city's personnel costs, uh, ours are not necessarily out of the line when you look at the percentage of budget. Uh, Towards, towards the overall operation. Typically, look at school districts as far as what, what they face in the way of personnel costs versus their operating costs. Oh, and and think, you, you normally see anywhere from you know a 60 to 70 percent personnel piece to budget. I agree with the percentages, but I think that what I'm looking at is you know we don't even have a utility that we're that we're billing for or anything like that. Like we don't have billing people, and you know what I mean. So we're we're missing some of those components. But, um, but overall, staff just does really well here. I mean, I was just looking at police department. For a comparable size of village of Slato, it's about 50, $55,000 for the size. Do we want to pay somebody a little bit more because we expect a little bit more? Sure, I'm not, I'm not opposed to that. But the average 
chief of police position in the state of Texas, which is below average from the nation, about $79,000, and we're, we're paying the average. So, you know, and, and that that looks at big cities and small towns, you know, kind of across the board. So kind of on most of our positions, we're paying the upper end. And with that, I think that the village just wants to get the upper end bang for their buck. So if we're paying for a service at this level, this is the service that we want. Well, and I, th I think the, the thing to keep in mind is, and, and I think you're right, and, and I think we always strive for that. And I think we do a pretty good job, mm -hmm. that, to be very honest with you. And, and, and you know, I, I believe you, I'm very sensitive. I, I'm sensitive to my salary. You know, I, I will tell you, I'm sensitive to everybody's salary from that standpoint. I will say this, and, 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 and that is, uh, get what you pay for. Mm -hmm. And I think we have paid the price in the past in the city by not recognizing that. And, and that's not, that's not an indictment of the past. Mm -hmm. What that's saying is that to hire quality police officers, for example, they look for a quality chief. You have to have a quality chief to hire a quality police officer in that standpoint. And, and you know, we've been blessed, you know, with Pat, you know, and, and his experience level and his contacts and his knowledge. And I will tell you, his reputation has, has been phenomenal in bringing people into this department. And this point, the experience level that we have raised in, in, in the last three months in this city, you know, from going from probably on an experience level of a total experience level of 30 years among all the officers in the department, uh, the fact that you're on the verge of getting 24-7 which I can't find somebody to tell me the last time year-wise we had 24 7 coverage. The fact that the city is doing some of the things it's doing administratively, I'll defend those all day long. But I'll also say this, we're doing our best to keep the administrative costs down. And, and, and we're sensitive to those, those concerns. I'm a taxpayer too. You know, we're all taxpayers and we're not tax and spend crazy. This board is not tax and spend crazy. And for people to imply that is, is an absolute falsehood that's meant to incite. So, you know, I, I think we, we, we strive, we strive to, to maximize efficiency. Sure. And I think that a, an important point also to note is that we're setting ourselves up for the future growth because that's going to be coming. And we saw in the, in the notes earlier, all the yes, homes ma that are going to be coming. So we need the expertise to, to get us to that point. But we just have to make sure that we're, you know, being fiscally responsible. Anyway. You're, you're totally right. And, and, I, and I tell you, a, concern, a huge concern I have is exactly what you said. And, and, and I meant what I said earlier in the fact that it, I, I'm all about the police and Pat is doing a good job of growing that department and getting to where it needs to be. But I will tell you with the growth we're facing, there's more of a need from a staff standpoint on the public works end mm -hmm. uh, than the police end. I'm not saying we don't need more cops. What I'm saying is that we are, we are not really staffed on the public works scene. And, and, and I think that there are two ways to, to go about that, you know, and I think that we're moving in that direction. Uh, but there's a lot of public works and stuff to do. Other questions or comments to Don from the board who, who did the road? Who did the slow of the road? I have to go back and look, Rodney, was it? I'm not going to mention it. Contractor the public wants to know for sure, but it's, it's not a local contract. Would it be an opportunity? We talked to Wheeler about the, when I first got here. We talked to that particular contractor. I'm going to say their name without full knowledge, but we talked to the contractor about why they're not coming back and repairing it. We were told they were under no obligations. Any other comments or questions, please? The time is 8.14. We're coming out of the regular Board of Aldermen and we're going into the hearing. I've already given you the instructions and the rules and regulations for this. So at this time, first of all, anyone who would like to speak may come there. Second call. Linda.
Linda Reynolds, 507 Santa Rosa. Normally I'd wait to the third call, but I've got to get home from my mom. Um, a couple of points. Number one, I'm very excited to hear things have changed. It's hard to come here to a public hearing and think that you had the paperwork and it turns out you don't. Uh, but I'm not going to quibble. If you're going back to the effective rate, uh, that's good for all of us, I, I think. And I would like to make the point that the alderman shouldn't worry about that for another year. This community will support you when you say we really need something. I don't know why we even are worried about a rollback uh, vote, because if we say uh, we really need the roads fixed, I think the village would come together and support. That's number one. Number two, uh, I would like our village manager to investigate the possibility of a better computer program for printing out the budget. When I collect the budget off the internet, and I'm no longer, I'm very out of it technologically, I do everything on the phone. I don't even have a computer, I don't have a printer anymore. But I had to go to the library and print out uh, the budget for a dollar and a half uh, so that I could actually read it. And then I have to get a magnifying glass because the print is really small. I know you don't like us to compare ourselves to other towns, but I looked at the Belton budget and I could read it online. It came out heads up. If I try to turn on my phone, then my phone goes and I don't know how to fix that. So I had to go print out at the, uh, and I'm still going through it and it's good to know you're still making changes. But I would like you to consider a program where online a person could read elderly or young rather than this really impossible print and uh, be able to make some wise comments about various lines on the budget. But I do appreciate and I really appreciate that we're giving the fire department uh, a rise. Um, I'm sorry that they, Shane didn't want the 10000 I may not pay him a donation this year if he didn't need it. But uh, thank you all very much for your hard work on the budget. Yes, uh, Darlene Walsh, 1001 Mill Creek Drive, Salado. Uh, just a couple of thoughts since we recently returned from uh, a couple months of vacation in another city in another state. And it's really nice to compare or to, to find good, you know, new ideas. And a couple of ideas I think I wanted to share with you. I wasn't planning on doing this, but uh, if we're looking for ways to save money, uh, one idea that uh, that they do in a small town about the size of Salado, uh, and they've been doing it for years very effectively, is recycling, and they have beautiful big bins uh, at the high school on the parking lot, and the whole town knows to go there for their cardboard, their glass, their this or that. I mean, it saves, I would think, a lot of wear and tear on streets uh, with huge vehicles coming, you know, we have the regular garbage and then we have the recycle guys coming through and uh, And everybody participates in that. It's a I mean, it's great and anybody who has something that they want to uh, Just give away they take over there a chair or a, an umbrella or what you know a, a Patio umbrella or whatever they sit it down there and somebody else picks it up and takes it home. It's uh it's a community effort to recycle and save their roads, and it works. I don't know why we can't do that here. Uh, and we have a big parking lot, or we're gonna have a bigger parking lot at school soon. So uh, you might save on wear and tear on our roads if we could do that. The other idea that I noticed uh, had to do with public restrooms. And what they do, and this is Traverse City, Michigan, which is a huge tourist town, and I mean, it's not a huge town. It's only 17,000 people, but in the summer it bursts with activity. And what they, what I noticed, and I can show you pictures because I was amazed. I took pictures of this. They have downtown on, on different shop windows, 
they'll have uh, ma have a map of where you can go, what shops, what buildings you can go to for public restrooms. That's a map, a easy to read for anybody in town that's not from town to understand. And, and, and some of them are just like bed and bath uh, shop or a, 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 another retail shop or whatever. There are certain shops that have agreed to open their doors as public restrooms. Now, I, I'm curious as to whether or not they get a break of some sort, maybe on taxes or whatever, because it costs them to do that. And, uh, and I, I hadn't looked into that yet, but I plan to. But, and then what they do is they have signs on these locations of big blue and white sign, public restroom, up and down Front Street and a few other streets. And there's probably about 10 or so uh, uh, signs in town. And if we could do that with the people that we now have in town that could offer and do offer public restrooms, basically because they're a brewery or they're just or they're a bar or they're this or that, I mean it's really a public restroom. Um, we could save another forty thousand, and and they would be dispersed throughout town. So those are just two thoughts as ways to possibly save us some money, and I wanted to share that. Thank you. Thank you, Dora. Drop your gavel just yet, Mayor. <laughs> I'm, I'm Tim Fleischer. I live at 912 Cedar Park Circle. And addressing the, the budget issue, you've desperately got to get your income up in terms of property taxes. And you can't, there are only two ways to do that. One is to increase your MO tax rate, which is um, a fraction of what every other city that has a tax rate. Most of the other cities that, that have a tax rate around ours have about a 40 cent INS, or excuse me, 40 cent maintenance and operation tax rate and about a 20 cent debt service tax rate. If, if you have the ability to, to move some pennies over from your uh, INS tax rate, to your M and O tax rate, where you don't actually increase someone's tax rate, uh, you need to take advantage of that because you can only increase to even hit the um, rollback rate. You can only increase your taxes by a couple of pennies at all, and you're crippling yourself if you go back to the effective rate this year. You cripple yourself in the future in terms of increasing revenue. And every increase of revenue that you get, I think you need to funnel into streets, period. Our streets are, are a travesty. They're falling apart. There's no money to do it. You won't be able to, if you pass a bond, it will have to be uh, very expensive to do that and we will become one of the highest taxing cities as opposed to having one of the lower tax rates. And that will keep people from investing and coming to the, to the city. The only other alternative to getting revenue is sales tax revenues. And while that's growing, you only collect a 1% sales tax revenue. Every other city that collects a sales tax revenue collects a penny and a half. And we have an entity that, that collects a half cent sales tax revenue and has a budget of about $400,000 and purchases less than $50,000 of books every year. You have to get a portion of that sales tax. And if you do get a portion of that sales tax, I think you'll find that that could be dedicated to the roads. Even at a quarter of a percent, which would leave about $200,000 to operate the library. Even at a quarter percent, you would generate well over $80,000 a year. That's a lot of revenue for the roads. Not nearly enough. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Christopher Seaton, 509 Indian Trail. Uh, 
Just a couple points of clarification. Did I understand you're proposing a tax rate of 57 total? Yeah, that's the effective rate. That's, in my opinion, going in the right direction. Okay, I, we moved in our house in 99 before we had a village government. We had police protection by the sheriff. We had fire protection by the same fire protection. We had a lot better road maintenance by the county at the time. Fast forward to today, I'm paying pretty much the same rate that these big cities are paying and get no more services than I did before. You know I've talked about animal control in the past. These other cities have brush pickup, garbage pickup, uh, probably a lot better road maintenance. I, I mean, I could go on and on. But we seem to be comparing ourselves to these big cities that we're a little bit lower, we're in line with them. We're not in line with them. Okay, the problem is we have 23,000, I mean, 2,300 citizens in the village and about maybe half of those are really paying a large portion of the taxes, okay? As a person who's paying a big chunk of that tax, I need a break, okay? I need a break. And I'm glad to see the ship is maybe turning and going in the other direction. I appreciate some of the questions tonight because I've had a lot of the same questions. Where, where is this money being spent? I know it's budgeted every year, but you kind of don't see where it's actually being spent. And I, I, I don't understand all the details of that. I, I don't have time to get into that. But I do appreciate what y'all do, but I think y'all just need to keep in mind there's a small portion of taxpayers that are paying for a huge benefit to all these people outside the city limit. You're talking about needing a new playground. Well, who's that going to benefit? everybody outside the city limit. I mean, I, I'd like to have a new playground too, but I mean, we're, we're asking a very small portion of people to pay for the benefit of everybody in the ETJs. And based on new laws, I, I kind of question why I even bother with the ETJs anymore. What's, what's, the, what's the purpose of them? I know in the past it was a plan to possibly annex them against their will to bring in more tax base. But as far as I understand, that's out the window. Is that correct? As of now? We've never had the ability to forcibly annex anybody. The only way we Until you got been, over 5,000 or whatever. Yeah, a, a until, limit. You're a, until you're a home old city, that's when it will take. Yeah. So I, I don't understand the concern about these ETJs that some people think they're going to voluntarily want to come in and pay out the teeth or taxes and get no benefits out of it. Uh, we need to keep our perspective in line here. We're not the big city, and we do not need to spend like the big city. Thank you. Thank you. Third call. Third and final call, if anyone wishes to speak on this hearing. The time is 8.29, coming out of the hearing, going back into the regular Board of Aldermen. Our second part of the hearing is Hold a public hearing regarding the proposed ad valerium tax rate for the 2019 tax year to help fund the proposed fiscal year 2020 operating budget for the village of Salado. Don? Mayor, we presented uh, the proposed uh, tax situation we're looking at. Again, what is before you in, roll, in your budget is a, a proposal to go to the rollback rate. We proposed an alternative to reduce the debt tax rate uh, and to basically bring that 6135 uh, rollback rate uh, down to the effective rate of 57.52. Specifically, it would be a reduction in the debt service rate to 46.5 and 36.82. Okay, questions to Don or comments?
I'm coming out of the Board of Aldermen and I'm going into the hearing part of this. Uh, it is now 8.31, same as the last. First call for anyone who would like to speak. I want to speak specifically on the tax rate and the part of the tax rate adoption I want to speak about are the exemptions. You have this year only, if you don't uh, address your exemptions specifically, we give a 20% homestead exemption to any homeowner, whether they're 65 or older or younger. Then we have an exemption and a tax freeze for over 65 and for uh, disabled veterans. The exemption for that we give to the over 65 is an additional $50,000 deduction from their um, taxable value. I think you've got to look at at least doing away with that exemption for the future. It will not affect anyone whose taxes are already frozen who are over 65 or anyone who is a veteran who has their taxes frozen at 65. What it will affect is someone who, who comes into Salado and turns 65 and then freezes their taxes. They'll still be able to freeze their taxes. You can never take away that tax freeze. You can, you, the village, no municipality that has passed a tax freeze can take it away. The state law does not allow that. It allows you to address your exemptions, but you cannot, and uh, Don can probably speak to this better, but I think you can only address your exemptions every 10 years after you adopt it. Yeah, so the next time that you could address and consider these exemptions of $50,000 for over 65 will be in 2029. Uh, when you have a lot of other people who have moved in and have frozen their taxes with that $50,000 exemption. The purpose of the exemption for over 65 for a school district makes sense because they are no longer a customer of that school district. Their children have grown up. They, they are not using the school district. So giving an exemption for a school district makes sense. But over 65 use municipal services a lot, probably as much if not more than those under 65 because they're the ones that are calling the ambulance and the fire department more often than those who don't. I think you need to look at that uh, $50,000 exemption for over 65. It won't affect anyone who's already frozen. It'll only affect new, new uh, residents who freeze their taxes. They won't be able to claim an additional $50,000 on top of the 20,000, 20% tax exemption. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Second call. Anyone who would like to speak to this matter? Third and final call. The time is 8.34, coming out of the hearing, going into the Board of Aldermen. Don. Yes. Just very quickly, when we sit down a couple of months ago, and we put together a list of what it would take to put this community on a basis of, that it could handle growth and everything. What was that final number? Oh, it was a couple million, three million. Three million. That didn't include the road budget. The, the, the concept of road repairs, we estimated were going to be the ballpark of, of five million, I believe. That yes. Four or five, yeah. And that just was for five million. That's just for one year. The next year, it would be another five million. Now you got 10 million. No, no. The concept on the road budget that we talked about was 
you would put together an improvement package uh, that would prioritize the roads. And when you looked at the cost of repairing those roads today, uh, what today's cost of it is, it would be in the neighborhood of about five million. You wouldn't do all five million in one year. You'd probably spread that over. Typically, you, you'll spread a road package out over three to five years. So you you, you get a bond issue approved for five million, uh, but you spread those improvements out over a five year period, okay. based on prioritization. So, folks, I just want you to know, I, I hear everything you say and. Some of the suggestions are really outstanding. But to run this village on now, if, if this passes one point, what, three million? One point two million? It keeps you awake at night, trust me. Well, I think the thing also is important to point out, Mayor, is this budget is probably, in my three years, this budget is probably the most on point budget as far as addressing the, the goals and priorities that were established by the council that year. Uh, you, most of your goals and priorities are, are tapped in some form or fashion through this budget. Thanks, John. Discussion and possible action. Number A, discuss and consider possible action regarding possible modifications to the Village of Salado Golf Cart Ordinance. John? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. We, we have an existing ordinance, uh, 201401, um, which really doesn't say a whole lot. It pretty much says that we can run a golf course on the streets. We don't have, have many guidelines. We don't have many safety factors. And I think it's, it's, it's an inherent responsibility of this board to impose things to help maintain the safety of golf course. We've all heard the horror stories about kids driving down the road, sitting in parents' laps, Overcrowded golf course. I brought those up last week, but I want to read you a couple of statistics off the uh, American Preventive Medicine Journal from 2000 to 2016. 150,000 golf course accidents across America. 150,000, and they range from two-month-old children to 96-year-old seniors. Okay. A couple ones that stands out: Robson County, North Carolina, teenager killed in a golf cart accident. Tulsa, Oklahoma, student dead, five other injured in a golf cart accident. Houston police officer fights for his life after a golf cart accident. Florida woman struck and killed, dies from a golf cart injuries. Las Vegas, 12-year-old boy falls off the golf cart and dies. 40% of golf cart accidents involve people falling out of golf carts. 31% of the reported accidents involve auto automobile golf cart accidents. Okay. I think after what we've all experienced and what we talked about the week before, um, we, we need to put some control measures in place. Now, according to the state of Texas, um, I guess it's called uh, Chapter 551 of the Transportation Code, allows the operation of golf course within a municipality. It also grants the municipality an authority to control the operation of motor vehicles, which golf carts are considered. It also permits the municipality to prohibit the use of golf courses within a city. Now, I'm not here to shut down the use of a golf cart. What I'm here is to talk about things that we can make things safer for people. So what I would like to propose for this board to consider is licensed drivers only for a golf course, okay? If you're not, if you're not able to get a license and you're over the age of 14 years old, you can possibly visit our police station attend a driver safety course and get a permit to drive a golf course. But these are just considerations, not rules, okay? Golf carts uh, um, should, main, should also have liability insurance in the event of an accident. The city is not going to be li liable for any kind of accident within the village just because we said you could drive a golf cart on the road. <coughs> All right. Uh, golf carts maybe should be prohibited from operating on the street with a speed limit of more than 25 miles an hour. And the reason I'm saying this is because as our city is growing, we now have the high school which is in our village limits. Does that mean somebody can drive a golf course down, golf cart down that road with a speed limit is 45 miles an hour and tangled with a larger truck or a pickup truck because they can only do 25 miles an hour? 30. It's 30? And there's a sign coming this way says 45 as soon as you got 24. Yeah, they can't be driving on the street for 45 minutes. <laughs> okay, right. So that's my point. They need to stay off streets with high-speed vehicles. Um, 
Also, I see people driving golf carts, holding little children, sitting in their laps. And I would like to maybe consider if your golf cart has four seats, you have four people in the golf cart. Uh, I don't think it's very prudent for anybody to be holding an infant in their arms while uh, texting on a cell phone and driving a golf cart. It doesn't make any sense to me. Um, and I think a golf cart should have the following things. If they're going to operate at night, I'm not sure if we can operate golf carts at night legally in the village of Salado, or we just restricted to daytime use. I, I'm not really clear on that yet. <coughs> you might be able to answer that. Right now, right now, the ordinance you have in place limits you to daytime legally, limits you to daytime operations only. Yeah, you have the ability to expand that, but if you do that, there's obligations to include certain types of safety equipment, be it lights, turn signals. Right. And that brings up my next point. If we're going to allow a golf course to operate on, which they do operate on, operate on our roads, headlights, tail lights, parking brakes, slow moving vehicle sign, rear view mirrors, and side reflectors. And I think that's mandated in the transportation law. Chapter 551 of the state of Texas. All personnel that ride in, in a golf cart should be seat belted if provided by the manufacturer. Okay, I know golf carts don't come with seat belts, but we also allow, uh, I guess they're called all terrain vehicles to run up and down our roads. They have seat belts, they need to be wearing the seat belts. Um, all golf carts will be subject to a stop by a police officer within the village of Salado. To make sure they adhere by the rules that we impose if we if we agree to do this and that's all i have so those are just points of discussion i wanted to bring up for this board to consider okay at this point because this is uh, an approval or not an approval what we have to do you may ask questions to john but this is not where you discuss it we have to have a motion on the floor and a second then we can discuss it. So if you have questions to Don, please do. I have a question. So in order to validate some of these things, like for instance, the liability insurance and those kind of things, um, are you planning on having a, a specific, I don't know, like a golf cart licensing, like so there's going to be like the golf cart's going to have a certain sticker or something to show that they've gone through the steps to, to be able to drive on our streets or I mean, with or without cost? You know what I mean? Where they have to come in here and get a, a golf cart permit, or how how do you plan on? I, I think what we need to do is is have the first thing. If you're talking about a non-licensed driver, or you just talk about the insurance. No, for any golf cart operating on a public street. Okay, I, I think what we can maybe impose is if the golf cart meets all the requirements to be on our streets, they can have a little registration sticker with an annual renewal, just like we do on our car. I don't know what the cost would be. I'm not sure what the wickets we have to go through to do that yet, but it's just food for thought. I think that we can easily identify golf carts with a small sticker like registration on your car. Other questions to Don? To Don or to John? Either. Either way. If, uh, if I am uh, driving with my four-year-old grandson down the uh, down our bumpy roads, I usually have him in my lap because uh, a four-year-old little toddler is like a wrestling an octopus as you drive down the road. And so if I'm not if I'm not going to be allowed to have him in my lap as I drive down the road, I guess I'll have to sit him in a in a seat. And if I, he's two years old or one year old and he's still subject to when he rides in a car, will we have to put him in car seats? So where do you where do you stop this? You know, when I was growing up, you know, the first the first seat belt that I ever used was my mother's arm across me. And uh, that I thought it was pretty effective myself. Still happens when I drive with my parents. <laughs> right. So yeah, we all grow so, so anyway, you know, now um, you know, I, I don't see how we're, that it's any safer for him to be riding in a seat ungrabbed versus sitting in my lap. And the second thing, uh, John, uh, I saw a guy that was uh, a young kid. He was driving down the road. He was about 12 years old. He was in a nice red golf cart and he had his, looked like his younger brother there. And he went right in front of me 
which was perfect, you know, so I got behind him and I was following him. He came to the stop sign going to the golf course and he stopped and looked both ways and carefully pulled out. And then he saw me in his rearview mirrors and uh, knew that I was behind him. So first, the first driveway, he came in and pulled off the side of the road and, and I went you know, right past him. And then he pulled out behind me and followed me down and went through the the uh, stop signs and followed me along the front low water crossing. So, you know, that kid has an enjoyment of driving his golf cart around with, you know, a parent that probably taught him all the, the rules of the road and did the parental duties. So are we going to be taking away his enjoyment of riding around and minding his own business in a, uh, in a golf cart? I think I think we need to grant it. His parents did a great job. I mean, I'm not saying everybody's bad. I'm not saying everybody breaks the rules. But what I'm concerned about is if the rules get broken, somebody gets injured. Okay, because we said they can. Then we've not done our job. Okay, and, and you're right. I, and I, I don't know what the what the right answer is as far as an end. I don't, I don't know. But that's things we have to discuss about and make the best possible approach. I don't think that you can successfully drive your golf cart safely if you, if you have an emergency situation, you've got an infant in your arms. I have no idea. Can, can you still maintain control of your golf cart? You know, why do they make infants stay in car seats in a car? Why don't they let you have your infant while you're driving your car? I don't know. I guess they maybe feel it's safer to have that infant protected in a car seat. Granted, we cannot anchor car seat in a golf cart because we don't have the anchor or the, the, the manufacturer isn't deemed it that way. But just because it it's not that way, it doesn't mean that we still can't look at the issue and come up with the best possible solution. I don't have all the answers. Okay. That's what this board is supposed to do. Decide what's the best path. And then and then the uh, you brought out a lot of statistics and everything that's nationwide and everything, but Locally here, what kind of statistics do we have? Have we had any near misses? Have we had any incidents where somebody was issued, injured? Absolutely not injured. Do we have any kind of police report that backs up any kind of statistics? I don't have anything. The only accident that we're aware of from a staff standpoint asking around is there was apparently something that happened on the golf course a couple of years ago. But as far as on the streets go, I know in my three years, we've not had an accident uh, Six or seven years ago, there was, was a, the a really bad one where the kid was airlifted. Was it on the course? No, it was on the Kirby Park coming down Chisholm Trail, okay. down that hill yeah. on Halloween. Okay. And there was another one right after that, too. It wasn't on Halloween. Okay, just, there's been nothing recently. Okay. So my, uh, you know, my, my, my position here is, is that, uh, you know, why pick something if it's not broke? kind of the, my, that's my philosophy and I don't want the government getting into my business and uh, and I'll be leading to a question your honor I can see you getting sort of twitchy there and uh, so I don't want the government in my business telling me you know how I can ride my golf cart and how I have to wrap my four-year-old little octopus grandson in and uh, but um, so so you know does that all fall in line with with uh, how you're envisioning that we enact this uh, ordinance I don't think we're opening the doors of government, government intervention. Yes. I think, well, again, we have the inherent responsibility to make our city as safe as possible. And I, respect and I think that's the bottom line. You know, we, we, I've seen many, many near misses on a golf course. I, I was coming up the low water bridge one time. The kid came around the golf course in my lane going down here. And he didn't even care. Okay, and it, it, it's going to happen, but we need to stop it from happening if we can. Like I said, I don't know all the rules. I don't know all the answers. I don't know what the path forward is, but it's up to us to decide what that should be. Point of order. Can we have a motion so we can actually have discussion? What's that? Can we have a motion so we can have discussion? I thought we are still in questions. We're not questioning anymore. We're commenting. Okay, uh, any more questions, please? So, John, behind this, is there going to be a bicycle ordinance? No, I don't think so. 
point out. The bicycles are just as dangerous as the golf carts. The kid can hit a car just the same way. The car, kid can be hit by a car. I don't see us having a bicycle ordinance in here. You know, we, we, we don't have a bicycle ordinance, and, and I, I don't want to tangle us up with stuff that doesn't apply to the subject matter. I think we need to stay on course what it's supposed to be. If you want to have a bicycle, bicycle ordinance, bring it up at the next meeting. No, this this is leading right down that road. I mean, I'm, if, if, we're, if we're concerned about the safety of the children in this community, why isn't that included in here? I don't have the answer for you, Rodney. I don't. Are there any more questions to John? I'll entertain a motion, please. Motion for discussion. Discussion, action, just discussion. Uh, I'll motion. Motion. Okay. Go ahead, motion. What you want to do in that into the ordinance? Yeah, the motion would be to direct staff to develop an amending ordinance. Okay, I'd like to make a motion for the staff to develop an amending ordinance based on the points I brought up in tonight's discussion. Second. Much has been made and seconded. Now you can talk about it. Discussion. <laughs> my thought process coming, um, you know, like I said, my family has a house on our Arkansas Pass, and so, um, you know, we're used to having the golf course or the golf cart ordinance down there. And I don't think anybody bats an eye at it because it's something that's been in place for a really long time and all the people who live there and the people who visit um, are very much well aware of it. Now, my thought process on this um, is we now have a rental, a golf cart rental company. They are going to have their own certain set of rules that, um, that go towards what they require for their rentals. Um, I would like to see what they're requiring um i'm pr probably i'm guessing it has to do with dri driver's license liability insurance those kind of things but um i want to see what they're requiring because we we probably don't want to be more stringent than what they're they're requiring but you know at least kind of look at line in line with that um i think as a minimum that we need to look at the the nighttime driving because that's a thing it's a thing in Salado. People are going to continue to nighttime drive. If they're going to drive, we need to fix it to where people can nighttime drive and they do it legally um, per the minimum standards for the state of Texas. Um, as far as um, getting permitted, the reason I was kind of lining up with that, that questioning is, you know, in most, most golf cart cities, there is some sort of registration process depending on what you require because you've got to physically get people in here to be able to tell them what the rules are. You can't just expect them to do it. And so, you know, having a minimum registration for whatever we decide on there, I think is key. Um, and I am, I am very much in support of some of these, probably not all of them. Um, I know the lap child problem, I get it. Um, but I'm also with my, you know, with the infant deal, you can't safely strap in a car seat. So you're just going to say, well, nobody under the age of like five or six can be in a golf cart. I don't think that's probably right. So we're going to figure out what other cities are doing in those, those instances too. But um, I would like to um, at least move this forward and after we come up with an ordinance that we can all kind of agree on because something has to change. So we may as well direct staff to start making those changes and then we can hash it out later. Further discussion, please. I think you need to be careful about what you're setting up here because our jurisdiction is within the city limits. And if we create something that requires registration, proof of insurance, all that kind of driving, anybody that's in the immediate area of our ETJ cannot get licensed, which means they could not operate that cart in town, which means those people that are on our perimeter that come into town with their golf carts to shop will no longer be able to do that. Because we can only give a license to someone who has an address in the village of Salado. That would be my understanding, because that's our only jurisdiction. So someone in the ATJ could not come in and get a permit to operate a golf cart within the village limits, because we would then be allowing them to break the law by operating their cart outside the city limits, which is not legal at this point. Yeah, you, I, I, I think if you wanted to, you could potentially issue a permit for those outside, you're not issuing a permit for them to operate outside the jurisdiction. They would only need that permit to operate inside the jurisdiction. If you do that, you have the ability to even charge different fees for, for out of town versus 
in town and things along those lines, but we certainly don't have the authority to, re to regulate outside the city. Because people trailer their golf carts and bring them to Mill Creek to play golf, yeah. and they have to have their golf cart registered with the golf course. And so I would imagine it's the same thing. I mean, if they trailered it into the golf course and then drove it around town, they would still need a, a permit. Can, can I call something out on the age issue? Uh, I, I don't know what every insurance policy says, but I will tell you I've checked with three different insurance policies for golf carts, and each one of those requires – if you're older, if you're the holder of that insurance, requires you to have a licensed driver to operate the car in the insurance policy. Three no, he's checks. 15, and, and he's not licensed, but he's permitted. You okay. know what I mean? He's a permit. Yeah. So I think you just have to be have gone through the driver's safety course. That's it. But there there is an age requirement for your insurance for most insurance, I mm -hmm. believe. Yeah, he's online. And that may address your need if you did insurance. <laughs> that may address the quandary of age restriction from that standpoint. I can tell you from a staff perspective, we talk a lot about it internally. And, and I will tell you, Amber, I think you're right, something has to be done. Uh, if we're going to be a golf cart community, I've said it before, we have to act like a golf cart community. How far you want to go is, is a tough challenge for y'all to go through it and walk through. But I will tell you from a minimum standpoint, from a staff standpoint, uh, I think you need to have some something in place that number one allows the nighttime driving, requires any vehicle being operated, golf cart being operated, to have lights if it's going to be driving at night. And we have quite a few that are driving around without lights. I'm not saying go retrofit every golf cart in town, but if you're going to drive at night, you got to have lights that illuminate, and that's brake lights and headlights. And of course, you've got the markings on the back. Uh, there are some cities that have taken the stand that if you have seat belts, you should wear the seat belts. They're not saying go retrofit and put seat belts on the cars, but if you have them, you should be wearing them. I don't know if you want to go that far. The insurance issue is is one that I think there's merit to. We require every motor vehicle in this town that drives on the streets to have it. And yes, it's not a motor vehicle, it's a golf cart, but at the end of the day, you don't require bicyclists, but at the end of the day, it operates as a vehicle and it's obligated to follow the rules of the road. Do you look at that? And then the lap, the lap issue is a concern. And, and, and I think, Mike, I'm totally with you on that 100%, but I will tell you if I had any, and Pat and I have talked a lot about this, and he echoes the same feeling. If we had anything we want to see from a staff perspective coming out of this thing, it would be the prohibition on the lap riding. Because I will tell you, one accident. One turn. I was driving down Main Street on mine the other day with one hand, not two hands, should have two hands on it. And I will tell you, I hit a bump and I literally just a slight movement and those things are have quick turn capabilities. And I could have flipped that thing. And I guarantee you, if I had a kid in my hand, there's no way I would have avoided flipping it or throwing the kid. And, and the thing that concerns me is you're putting a vehicle in front of a large vehicle mm -hmm. and the slightest movement could turn the golf cart over, could turn it into the vehicle. If it gets hit, no one stands a chance, but the thing that gets thrown the farthest is that which is in your hands. And that that's a concern. And, and But I'm with you, I understand exactly what you're saying. Uh, but I, I think the lap, the lap riding is a concern for us. Uh, and we see a lot of it. And I tell you, I saw a gentleman the other day, it was chilly, and I saw somebody the other day driving with, with holding a baby in the lap one wheel on the hand, and in the hand that was holding the baby was holding a beer can. <laughs> and the, the concern I've got is, is it every driver that way? No. But it's one. Is the police officer going to be there to catch that one at that time? No. But if he is there and has the capability to be there, at least you've got some type of tool to go after him with on that end of it. But, I, you know, again, I understand exactly what you're saying. How, how far do you go? But that's a safety issue. And insurance may not be something. I mean, insurance is a, is a backdoor way to get into looking at age. Nighttime, you need to allow the nighttime hour to be this. Because, I, I mean, the nighttime, people drive it. I mean, uh, quite frankly, I, I challenge you to say that there are probably more people that drive at dusk or an early evening or the same amount that drive here in the day. I would, 
I would just say that I'm in, I'm in favor of the night driving. I'm driving mine at night. Whether this passes or not, I'll still drive mine at night. I am not going to wear a seatbelt. I don't give a rip what this group says. I just won't wear a seatbelt. I'm not going to do it. Uh, the lap, right, lap riding, I, I'm, I'm on board with you guys. I, I, I hear Mike's concern. I've, I've got a grandbaby. I'd love to take her around and do that, but is it the right thing to do? No, not, not at her age. And uh, I'm, I'm kind of in the middle on the liability insurance. I, I keep liability on mine. I've always had liability on my starts. I'm sure most people do. But uh, I think if you care enough about what you're doing and you want to protect yourself from the sudden accident that could occur, like you're talking about, you would, you would have insurance to protect you. So, um, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in favor of some of this, but I'm, I'm also with Frank. I'm, I'm kind of like, yeah, I don't want to go overboard, but mm -hmm. I want to start moving some things, but not, I don't want to go full board the other way. So. Well, I got a question what Frank said. So this could be crafted to where the people in the ETJ come into this, walk when they come into the city, but they got to follow the rules. What you're requiring, what you would in a sense be requiring is if you operate in the city, you're obligated, if, if you go this permit route, you're obligated to have a permit. And it's your option, I guess, to, to decide whether you want to allow an out of city permit or in city permit. Amber points out there are people that cart their carts in. You know, most of those folks, I assume, drive, drive from the parking lot number fours, but, but there may be some that want to drive downtown and grab a bike feet after running a golf by, you know, from that standpoint. I, I would suggest this, if you're going to charge a permit fee, if you're going to do a permit fee, i differentiate between the city and the town. But if the county has not allowed the use of golf carts, then we're encouraging people to break the law there's, that's by driving true. into the village. That's a very true statement from a standpoint of the fact that in this last legislative session, as we talked at the last discussion, the county opened, the, the counties were, before this last legislative session, counties didn't have the authority to, to allow golf cart traffic. Now they do. So I would assume if, if we move in this direction and, and look at some type of permitting piece or something along those lines, and you want to look at encouraging outside, we're going to need to visit with the commissioner's court about making West Village Road, Thomas Arnold, you know, uh, those type of roads. Uh, Williams, I don't think Williams will ever qualify for it, what the final speed limit gets going that road is. But, but I think from a standpoint of West Village and Saleo School and Thomas Arnold, well, look at the places that have, ours. look at the people that have golf cart paths into the village, like Barrow's one subdivision. Yeah. You know, it has a golf cart path into the village. They're not in the village. Their roads aren't in the village, but they have a golf cart path that comes in. I mean, that's the purpose of it. Well, so. Ronnie points out, Stead Mill is another one. I mean, yeah. Stead, Stead Mill has one coming down, but Salado School Road is ours now. A portion of Thomas Arnold is ours. West Village is still the county, and the rest of Thomas Arnold is still the county. Right. And, and you got Stan Mill that's got one coming in. You know, you, you've got, to be honest with you, Lowry, you know, you, I go back and forth between the mayor's, the mayor's neighborhood and mine, I'm driving my golf cart on a county road. Yeah, and, sure. and that's that's not legal, but I mean, everybody's driving that golf cart on a county road. So I mean, um, I would those assume those people are going to cleared up. And they probably need to get cleared up regardless of whether you permit or not, because the Lowry deal, everybody drives on Lowry. And, and, and if we're going to do that with the new law, we need to visit with Bobby and see if we can get that changed and let them do that. Same with, to be honest with you, same potentially with, with the folks coming out of Stenton Mill, you know, on, on, on the Chisholm. Mm -hmm. and as, as far as the night driving, I mean, we talked earlier about stroll. How many carts are out on, at night on stroll? <coughs> Pat, hey, come stroll time. You got an open ticket season <laughs> right out there. <laughs> <laughs> Until we, that's that's one reason we need to clean this up. Is uh, we're we're encouraged. I mean, we're encouraging that to be a, an open item. No, there's there's one thing that that uh, if we're going to go down the, the path of uh, of making a change to our ordinance, is there a way we could actually put a, a outline on our map? Because I really don't think that we need to have golf carts on the west side of the road unless they're taking them to fairway to get fixed. 
Johnny's. I, I will tell you, I've been I've been surprised in the, in the last couple of months. I've seen more more people that park out front Johnny's with golf carts uh, during football season. I, I see see him driving on Slow School Road sometimes. I don't see that much on West Village, to be honest with you. Most of what I see is crossing the interstate and jumping to Johnny's or, or that. But yeah, I, I think we we can do that. Make make it more visible on the map. I don't like change, but I think we need to look at that. In response to your question, and, and, and as far as do you require them to put them in a child seat, that may be an option. But in order to have a child seat, they're going to need to have a seat belt to secure that the child seat there. But well, that may be the alternative to laugh if they want to drive drive with the car. And does it match the child seat specifications, like the safety? Because if it you get into like some legal issues, like you have to buckle it in, but the manufacturer doesn't recommend you buckling it in that way, then. Yeah, forward, facing forward, facing backwards. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, there's no way going forward. I'll be honest, Mia rode in the car seat in our golf cart when she was like four months old. So. Y'all are taking all the joy out of me riding out of my golf cart. <laughs> Folks, I, uh, I really appreciate this kind of discussion, but the motion on the floor as to whether we're going to pick this up and carry it forward. Then we can have more discussion if you decide to do that. So I will entertain a motion. The motion's already there. But, but the motion is to accept everything that you said. No, the no, motion no, no. was to direct staff to come up with an ordinance for said. discussion. And what will happen is you will you will get that ordinance and you can strike or add. Okay. And there is a second to it. We've okay. had the discussion. Now then, I'll hear the call to question. Question. All in favor, if you'd raise your hand, please. Opposed, likewise. Fails. Mayor, I make a motion to direct staff to create an ordinance that allows for nighttime driving with golf carts. Okay. So, motion has been made and seconded. Discussion? Question. Question has been called. All in favor, raise your hand. Opposed, likewise. Passes. We will do so and we will put it on your 50%. Okay, number B. Discuss and consider possible action authorizing the village administrator to enter into an agreement with a professional lighting contractor to work on the two gateway signs located on Interstate 35 within the corporate limits of the village of Salado and to amend the fiscal year 2019 operating budget to reflect the cost for such work. John? Mayor, as we've indicated, uh, at your direction, you asked us to, uh, to get with some contractors and, and get some uh, proposals put together to get these get these signs permanently lighted so you can make a decision of whether you want to pull the trigger and have the village move forward with the project. Uh, we received information, uh, all the information that, was, that they had uh, from the originators of the project regarding the light schematic. As I mentioned, uh, the, the contractors we visited with have indicated that uh, some of the some of the lights that have been installed on, on the structures are, are not exterior rated. They're, they're in fact interior rated materials. Uh, that said, uh, there clearly were some issues with the original work that was done with the lighting and, and installed as far as the, the control system and the solar system in particular. Uh, so what we've done is we've we've worked with the contractor and we have proposals and we're comfortable. Uh, we think with the, the power pack that, that, that we've come up with a proposal on. Uh, that would handle both of the, of the lights, both of the gateway signs. Um, it would involve basically the installation of a new solar system uh, with, with state-of-the-art uh, technology uh, and uh, a compact product uh, as opposed to piecemealing different things together. Uh, and we think that the solar packs, uh, each unit would cost somewhere in the neighborhood of about two, Total somewhere in the neighborhood that as far as the uh, heat and the total two signs, we'd, we'd be looking somewhere in the neighborhood of about $8,300, $8,500 thereabouts uh, based on looking at the sensors we put in, based on the panel systems, based on the controllers. Uh, at this stage of the game, we're going to try to use the existing beds as opposed to relocating the beds. We have quotes on what it will take to run the conduit from the power pack, uh, you know, to, to the sign. Uh, 
we think that we have flexibility with panels in this power pack that we don't have the current installation uh, that, that was done. We have the ability to, in other words, move the panels around, point them in different directions, those type of things. So initially, I think we'd like to try installing, if we move forward on this, installing behind the signs uh, with the power packs. It's a self-contained system as opposed to the current system, which has multiple pieces that have been wired together things along those lines. So uh, we're waiting to get an installation cost. I should have that installation cost by tomorrow afternoon, potentially, or Monday. What I'd say is this. I'd like to put this as an additional item on next week's special meeting on Thursday so we can pull the trigger one way or the other on this thing. Uh, I think you're probably looking, I would, if I were a betting person right now, I think you're probably going to be looking at a total ticket somewhere in the neighborhood of about $12,000. Uh, both sides? Uh, yeah, 12 to 15. Uh, and, and that's, you know, if we have to relocate the, the panels and relo or relocate the packs, uh, we're going to have to deal with the cable and then deal with the conduit. And, and that's going to be more expensive because we have to meet state standards from ever doing that conduit. Really. So you're looking at several thousand dollars more than that. But I, I'm encouraged the numbers are not as high as I thought they were. Uh, our proposal is, is not to use what has been installed in, in there as far as the controller and the solar system at this stage of the game and literally install this self contained kit at each location. Uh, the kits themselves, the base price of the kits themselves run somewhere in the neighborhood of about 3000 3200 something like that. So you're looking at the total cost of 12000 Well, I think, you know, until we get the installation cost, but I think I think you're looking at twelve to 15000 probably. Okay. Once approved, how long would it take to complete? Uh, our hope would be we get it done in about 30 days, if not soon, but I think that would be our plan. We're working, we're working with a group out of Austin that has quite a reputation. In fact, uh, we, we got their name from one of the suppliers of some of the, the product of the original sign. We were puzzled why okay. some of what was used. Any more questions to Don? Will it have a warranty? Yes. We'll have a warranty. How long? <laughs> each product, each product has its own one. You need a motion tonight. I do. No, no, not tonight, because because again, we're going to put it on next week's agenda for a quick action. Time, but uh, I want to make sure we have the installation. Okay, number C. Discuss and consider possible action regarding the route of the 2019 Serena Fest Parade in Salado, Texas. Yes, sir. Uh, this is a kind of a boilerplate item as they come forward to get approval. Uh, the route is the same as, as they've used, and they basically are coming off of a Pace Park uh, on the north side of Pace Park and working their way down Main Street, turning onto Royal Street, going to Barrows. Uh, it starts at 11 o'clock in the morning, uh, and staff has reviewed it and recommends approval as we have in the past. Questions to Don? Entertain a motion, please. Motion to approve the 2019 Serena Fest Parade route. Is there a second? Second. Motion has been made in second. Discussion? Question. Question has been called. Everyone in favor, raise your hand, please. Opposed, likewise. <laughs> Discuss and consider possible action regarding the plans for the 2019 Salado Grape Stomp on September 28, 2019, in Salado, Texas. Don? We've got a typo on that, as you can see in the briefing packet. The date event is actually September 21. Uh, same plans as last year. This is done at the winery. That's a very successful event. And the biggest issue we deal with on this particular event is parking. And they've done a good job of managing it and contacting adjacent property owners to allow for the park. So staff recommends approval. Entertain a motion, please. Motion to approve. Motion has been made to approve. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? Question. Question has been called. All in favor, raise your hand. Opposed, likewise, passes. Discuss and consider possible action of the comprehensive fund balance policy and the fund balance classification plan for the village of Salado. Mayor, Mayor, again, this is just a boilerplate item of the year end deal where we look at the investment policy and the comp plan policy, or excuse me, the comprehensive fund balance policy. This is the policy that basically sets out uh, how your fund balance is allocated. It does not just set that in stone. You have the ability to change that at any given time. Uh, it identifies the various funds we have. And it also sets out the proposed allocation uh, for those funds. In the general fund, we're proposing that 
uh, in our general fund balance of 40% of the funds be allocated uh, under the committed fund balance category for public works or roads drainage, 25% of the funds for future grant matches, 35% for funds for wastewater operations. Uh, under hotel occupancy tax, we have 10% of the fund balance set aside for emergency tourism marketing, 90% of the funds set aside for physician operations, and then the wastewater fund, obviously, 100% of the funds for wastewater plant operations. Staff recommends. Questions to Don, please. I'll entertain a motion then. Move to approve the comprehensive fund balance policy. Second. Motion been made and second. Discussion? Question. Question has been called. All in favor, raise your hand. Opposed, likewise. Passes. Number F, discuss, consider possible action of the investment policy for the village of Salado. Don? Uh, Mayor, members of the council, this again is a year in boilerplate item where we have to adopt the investment policy. Uh, no changes are proposed in the investment policy as we've talked in the past. It's a very conservative policy. Uh, we, we basically keep our funds in check school or we keep it in our bank. And we have the coverage allowed by and required by state law. Uh, we, do not have anything exotic in here as far as where we can take our funds. We're very conservative. Uh, we're not moving in the direction of Bitcoin, even though the state legislature passed a bill this year that, that allowed municipalities and counties and governments to, to begin looking at Bitcoin as a currency. We're not there uh, and, and, and not planning to go there at this stage of the game. Uh, so our staff recommendations. Questions, Don? I'll entertain so, a motion. So Don, you act as our Yes, sir. Yeah. Any more questions to Don? I'll entertain a motion, please. Move to adopt. Motion has been made. Is there a second? Second. Motion has been made and seconded. Discussion? Discussion. A uh, question has been called. All in favor, raise your hand, please. Opposed, likewise, passes. Discuss and consider possible action regarding proposed changes to the Village of Salado's economic development policies and procedures. Mayor, I'd like to defer this item until the 19th meeting. 19th meeting it is. Discuss and consider possible action number eight. Discuss and consider possible action regarding the appointment of members to the Village of Salado Tourism Advisory Board. Mayor, as the briefing sheet indicates, uh, we have basically uh, three people whose terms have come up, one who has had to leave because of uh, other obligations. Uh, the, the three that, whose terms have expired have all indicated a willingness and a desire to be reappointed, and that's Gail Planson, Larry Crellup, and uh, John Shipman. Uh, Will Lowry uh, also has indicated he's out. Uh, his term has expired. So with that said, uh, Shipman, Prelop, and Blanchett have expressed interest in reappointment. Will says he has a prior commitment and uh, cannot continue. So, uh, before you tonight for your consideration, we've not received any other applications for this board other than these. Questions to Don? Don, how many does it take to make this board? Uh, it's a seven member board. And if we only will have how many members when we approve these three? If we approve these You'll three. You'll be minus one. one. Minus one. Who are the other three? Uh, the other three. Yeah. Uh, you have uh, Kate Coachman. Uh, you have David Hayes. And you have uh, Table Rock. Uh, Jackie. Jackie. Jackie Mills. And I think that Chadley is, is going to be trying to talk to see if Donnie is interested in maybe filling in for Jackie's during her absence. Do I, uh, is there any questions, more questions to uh, Don? I'll entertain a motion, please. Uh, one question, Don. Don, how are we getting this out in the community that we desperately need people to serve on committees? I think it's, you know, we, we pushed it uh, through, through public comment. We pushed it through uh, media. We pushed it through meetings talking about it. We've actually beat the doors on this deal and gone and knocked people and knock, knock on people's business doors and asked them if they've got interest in it. I just think that it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a special interest committee, and that's not a negative thing to say, but it's one that you really 
a lot of times you got to have a vested interest in it to, to really see the, the, the views jump in the middle of it. Keep in mind, this particular board has specific requirements for membership as far as the arenas that they're supposed to represent. For example, when you come to the point of, of hopefully getting somebody to come into Phil Will's place, that person's going to need to come out of the lodging industry because he was one of the lodging industry reps. Kay's a representative of the retail community from that perspective. So, yeah. And I think we're going we're gonna to try to figure out, I, you know, part of me, Tim can help out, I know. We push it on Facebook. We uh, not Facebook. We push it on our website. We push it in our door-to-door -door in our community meetings. We always try to mention it when we make our presentations. Uh, I'm hoping that we're able to establish like a quarterly newsletter of some sort, be it digital or hard mail that, that we can do, that we can push it in that end of it. We encourage you all, when you run into people, you all talk to more people a lot of times than some of our other people do, but you encourage it. And I know you've brought some names forward, uh, you know, in those situations. So it really it has got to be a mass, mass communication. I brought Don Krause forward. I want credit for that. You want more than him. You brought others too. So. And I know Tim's helped us in trying to get the word out too. But I mean, I, it's it's a deal. But a lot of times you got to keep people's interest. Okay. I'll entertain a motion, please. Will we accept the appointments? Motion has been made to accept the appointments. Is there a second? Second. Motion has been made and seconded. Discussion? Questions. Question has been called. All in favor, raise your hand, please. Opposed, likewise. <laughs> Passes. Don, we still a sharp one there, right? Yes, sir. All right. Number I, discuss and consider possible action regarding the Yeah, discuss and consider possible action regarding the appointment of members to the Village of Salado Economic Development Advisory Board. Mayor, you've got uh, a board that you've established with seven members to be chaired by uh, Mayor Pro Tem Coachman, and uh, we issued a public call. The word got out. We, we received, uh, we had four interests. So one, of the, one of the four has indicated they've taken a prior uh, engagement with the church committee, so they had to pull out. Uh, but we have three that uh, are currently in place for application and you have their names that are in front of you and they are all here tonight if you would like to uh, spend a minute talking to them and finding out a little bit about more more what they're about uh and getting to know them hmm. you have their resumes that are in front of you and they're all four here uh, i don't see larry i don't see larry he's supposed to be here larry, larry has a prior engagement there you go Larry Linder. Okay, folks. Um, if you have questions that you would like to ask or entertain or uh, talk to these folks, let me ask you this. I know it's very late, but this is important. Um, the, the ones that are here that have put your names out, would you please come and take a seat up here, please? And Mr. Lunders indicated he will be here on the 19th. Okay. Would you please give us your name and would you please tell us why you want to be on this? Sure. My name is Debbie Stevenson, former mayor of
for the, the focus on international commerce and the kind of double major with the foreign languages because international commerce requires foreign language skills. Uh, well, I had big high hopes of the minister going to the United Nations and the World Bank and helping down my homeland to Africa, Southern Africa. But a young Texan tipped his hat and stole my heart, and here I am in Sweaty, Texas, and I love it. Um, from the time we got here in 88, um, I covered uh, my first story with Grace Jones, <laughs> when she still had her story. And I got to drive her to the fashion show that was held at the recently renovated um, uh, building. And I got to see Slater and her house. And I, brought, and I told my husband and I went back home, I said, when we retire, we're coming to Slater. So that was a dream that I realized. Even when my horse died out of, um, and we gave up our acreage, it was a move from Slater, rural, rural, to uh, to Mill Creek. Um, I bring to the table a, a lot of business journalism. Um, I, I was, I don't know if you've all heard of the Oklahoma City Economic Development Initiative, but it was called MAPS, the Metropolitan Area Projects. I had got the opportunity to be on the business desk to cover that firsthand and to see what an economic development committee can do. Um, they are now in phase four. It was a pay-as-you-go, uh, one cent sales tax that everybody has chosen to renew four times now. The transformation from a rundown, what do we do city, to an absolutely thriving hustle meeting shows what you can do with an economic development plan. And shows what you can do when you sell when you have the communication skills and an overall, just a, just a plot and a map and a roadmap towards success. Salado, has tremendous problems. We, we've been through a lot, but one thing we need is a road plan, and that's why I wanted to be a road planner. As soon as I heard that there was going to be CEO, oh my goodness, I was jumping up and down. <laughs> and I think I was one of the first ones to apply right up. So I, I was actually listening to one of the recordings um, of this of the myself when we when we first got out of work. And I thought, you know, this is just the opportunity I've been looking for. I'd love to serve. I hope you would like me to serve because I am ready to go. Very well. Questions. Other questions, please. Uh, I have a question. Um, just a two a two minute presentation. How would you direct us down the road for economic growth as far as retail? Because that's the most important thing we can bring in. I've had first hand um, had a first hand look at retail. Um, one of the economic uh, things that you learn with the with EDC is foot traffic versus costs. Um, the, stat, the prevailing wisdom um, with, with any, in any economic uh, uh, development corporation is this. You've got to have this, you've got to figure out how many people it takes to come in to make that sale at a certain level. Um, in other words, your foot traffic counts. And it takes between one to 10 to walk through the door and look, you get that one sale, um, depending on the price point that you're at. Uh, sometimes it could be 20. I can tell you right now, my store does not have the foot traffic necessary to sustain the store at standing alone. It, real estate is supporting my retail operation. Um, I sell more in my staged homes than I do in the store. My QuickBooks doesn't lie. And I do not have the foot traffic. Neither does any of, you know, I've chatted with some of the folks up and down on um, Old Town, um, Old Town House, uh, sorry, Old Town Gallery, Old Town Center. Um, and none of us really have the foot traffic. So I think one that is going to have to be something that we really have to focus on now. We had an Oklahoma City group. We didn't have any, um, and I use them as an because in 2016, they were, they were nationally recognized for this part. Um, when you go somewhere, do you go, do you want to walk into a place that's got road construction everywhere? Or do you go into a place that's got, that has got um, roads in the condition of Slater Plaza Road? 
it's, it's hard sometimes for me to get somebody say through when I'm showing, for example, in Georgetown, in Cimarron Hills, in that price point. I bring somebody here first. I always try to bring them here. Um, and then I've got to take them down Slater Plaza and go through the road and look, you look right, you look left, and the creek is overgrown. There's still, even to this day, flooding residents. So one of the big things we've got to do is clean up our act. How do we do that? We've got to come up with initiatives to put that money, to find, number one, the residents willing and able to do it. But I would say, let's, let's follow a little bit of an example of a success story like Oklahoma City. They didn't ask the residents of property taxes to do it. They asked the consumers, all the horse shows that were coming into town. They, had, they went on the thing that if we have one cent tax, that ripple effect of that one cent is, did you know for every dollar spent, for every 100 cents, we have got a $6 economic ripple effect. One thing leads to another, and it brings people in. They did that in San Antonio when they set up the ripple. You know, these, are, these are big, big you know, examples that I'm using because everybody's familiar with these. But those, those, places, uh, those places were not there before. Bricktown was a rundown warehouse district that was not sure when I saw an eyesore. The same with San Antonio, Riverwood is nothing but an eyesore. They're, they're destinations now, and we have to create beauty. We, we talked about uh, the streetlights in Salado. Down, up and down. That's one of the things. I had several people come in for an open house uh, during Christmas troll. They couldn't find my, my office because it was so dark. Well, San Diego, has anybody been down to the gas lamp district? Beautiful. At some point, they found the funds, they found the, the, the way to put those in. They found the old ones there. It's, it's and it's the ambiance. I can think of nothing more beautiful than the way I come to find you and going down up and down the street. So, things like that. Yes, I've given it a lot of work, and I could probably talk with that on, but we've all been here rather right late. <laughs> I can see Tim and I are just pouring in on me. <laughs> He's waiting for the pizza. Hang on. <laughs> So I will shut up if I've answered your question. You really did. Thank you very much. Anyone else would like to ask a question? I'm afraid to after that answer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, you want me to talk you <laughs> Where's your ring there when we need it? I know. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate your enthusiasm. You really too. Exactly. Thank you. <laughs> Two minutes or less. All right. I'm Don Krause. You all know me. Um, I live at 1409 Elizabeth Circle. Uh, my contribution, I think, would be that I have a uh, expert level of understanding of finance and accounting, which allows me to be able to look at deals fairly effectively, determine how they're set up. And secondly, my objective in life at this time is to get more money into Salado's budget. And I think that it's necessary to set up economic development in order to do that. So that's less than two minutes. <laughs> Any questions, please, for Don? I'm, I'm very glad you uh, applied, Don, and appreciate your time. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I tell you, I, I love this town. Know that. And, uh, anything I can do, sort of driving off the building or something, I'd be happy to do that. Well, we don't want you to do that. I figured that just like <laughs> Don, reconcile so you currently sit on planning and zoning. Right, and I raised the issue already with some <laughs> folks and said, is it all right? And actually, I think there's a benefit. Certainly, there was a benefit to me being on the small lot size dash force on because I got to see everything before my eyes. And I think there is a meshing of economic development in Z that um, would be beneficial to both to be able to, you know, at least the ideas will cross that and cross the So I'm willing to do both if you guys are. All right, so, and I'm not, I'm not saying either one. If you had to choose between the two, I had to choose what would be two. the preference? Uh, 
I would like to stick with these men. Why? He's he asked the same question, so. At least he didn't say howdy. Well, you guys don't know, but I have a degree from UT. That's not helping the issue. Look at that, he's off the DZ too. <laughs> Yeah, we know what you're doing tomorrow night. We can't go to the a and tailgaters and stuff. But anyway, um, I, I just think there's a nice crossover here. Uh, and, uh, I think I can do service to both. Uh, but I do agree that there may be too much overlap. So that was my concern. My, my concern doesn't lie with your ability to work with both groups and be an objective participant in each. My concern would rise, given the, given the plethora of uh, applicants we have, uh, that we might be keeping somebody out that uh, isn't getting the opportunity to participate. I'm not saying that... I, I want you on one or the other. I'm just saying that given the fact that if there was somebody else, then you're holding two spots. That well, I, I'm happy to negotiate that if, if that's going to throw up. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm just raising the issue. I'm not speaking to either side. I'd yeah, be so. happy to. I'm at your service. Literally. Tell me what you want me to do and I'll do it. I can't like follow that. that. Very well. Yes, this sir. is this is this is your chair to my right, Mayor Pro Tem Coachman Frank. Would you like to ask any questions, or do you feel comfortable? I am enjoying listening to what's being said, uh, Don. I have to tell you, I have a little bit of reservation about doing both, and and just from my perspective, is I think you could get caught in a perception if you had to rezone an area that was being marked for economic development, that it could put you in a sticky situation. That's, in, I mean, I can't come up with a specific, but you're negotiating on this side and these people are coming to the PNZ and you've already got internal knowledge or insider knowledge, somebody's gonna turn that on you. They're gonna try. And well, it's, that that's, yeah. You know, it's, it's fine with me. I'm happy to be happy to serve as a consultant for the economic development committee. <laughs> I'm not saying that I'm, you know, I've made a decision that I'm against it. I'm not saying that at all. I just, I want to make sure you understand. I think it's the same reservation Rodney's expressing that there could be a perception of that it's not. Exactly my fear. Okay. I just want to make sure we understand the same thing, but I can let's see. You're going to have to make a decision. We're told to vote yes. So, you know. <laughs> We're on vote yes. Now, I'm happy to serve on both, at least in the beginning stages. It becomes cumbersome, cumbersome. Um, if it becomes cumbersome or or difficult, or we run into any kind of political activity at all, I'll resign from one or the other. At your at your um, whatever you instruct me to do. Now I have no problems. If you don't want to appoint me, I won't get mad and go home. And, you know, I won't do it. John, the other one is Larry Lender. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Is, are there any more beside those three? Not off the top of my head. I know Gail submitted one, but I think it was for tourism. Yeah. Um, Ronnie, have you talked to Larry about being on this? I have. I, I asked Larry to apply. Um, Larry is a commercial banker with First National Bank of Texas. He handles commercial portfolios across the state of Texas for multi family dwellings, for shopping centers, for all kinds of stuff. So I, I know his background, um, but I'm going to let him, he's going to come the 19th, and I'll let you all talk to him. But he did say yes, or that he was interested. He was in very show. interested. Yeah, okay. very, very good. He uh, offices out of Harper Heights over in the Central Point, uh, Central Point mm -hmm. area. Well, we've got two here. Do we want to wait for Larry and see if anyone else? Choice. I mean, it's whatever you want to do. 
mean, you're going to have, you're not going to have, I, I don't think you're going to, I, I hope you'll have three more on top of them next time to talk to, but okay. you can appoint now or wait until the end. It's your choice. Okay, I'll entertain a motion, please, as the direction in which you wish it to go. I'll make a motion we adopt the two candidates that are before us tonight. Second. Motion has been made and seconded. Discussion? I'd like to add an amendment to that to go ahead Shall and we? place Mr. Linder in there also. Okay. And accept three tonight for this uh, committee. Okay. Would you accept that? I'm open to that if John's open to that. John, are you Absolutely. open to yes, that? Sir. Okay. Let's vote on amendment first. Um, all in favor, raise your hand, please. Passes. Now we have three candidates that we're going to take a look at. And uh, you, you any just discussion? Them, right? Pardon? You just appointed them. I know, but I want a motion. I want to make sure that this. I mean, I've got the motion. I want a vote. That's what I want. Okay. Okay, now discussion. Question. Question has been called. All in favor, raise your hand. There we are. Bless your hearts. <laughs> this, this God one. speak. God you, speak. Yeah, good luck. Yeah. Can I get your number on speak? <laughs> uh, yeah. What is your number, Frank? <laughs> Just ask any band director, car director, or director of the state. They've got it. They'll give it to you. Don't call them on Friday night. That's where I get oh, most of my calls. How long have you lived here? Um, we built our farm in 2001. Um, and then we moved into, into Milk Creek in 2008. Okay. Well, but I've been in the Texas area on and off with the military since 1988. And you, you have your own realtor? Your own realtor? I'm, I'm a broker in my own life. I'm affiliated with uh, Jacob and Newport because they were picked up. John, you're on two committees now. You'll have to make up your mind if it's a little bit too much. I know you personally, and uh, it's it's good to have you, but I want you to be really careful with this one. Pardon? <laughs> Checks in the mail. Good luck on that one. Um, Checks in the room. a motion to adjourn. So move. Second. Where's those two children? We need to get them on the carriage. Adjourn. Let's pass their bed time.